All right, it looks like we're all here, so why don't we go ahead and get started. So good afternoon and welcome to our 1.30 p.m. session of the September 8th, 2020 meeting of the Santa Cruz City Council. I have a few announcements and then we'll move on to our regular meeting. Today's meeting is being broadcast on Community Television Channel 25 and streaming on the city's website, cityofsantacruz.com. All members of the City Council are participating in this meeting remotely and want to thank the public for staying home to view today's City Council meeting. If you wish to comment on an agenda item today, call in at the beginning of the item you are wanting to comment on using the instructions on your screen. Please mute your television or streaming device once you call in and listen through your phone. Please note that there's a delay in streaming, so if you continue to listen on your television or streaming device, you may miss your opportunity to speak. When it's time for public comment, please press star 9 on your phone to raise your hand. When it's your time to speak, you'll hear an announcement that you have been unmuted. The timer will then be set to two minutes, and you may hang up once you've commented on your item of interest. And with that, I would like to ask the clerk to please call the roll. Thank you, Mayor. Councilmember Byers? Here. Matthews? Here. Brown? Here. Golder? Here. Watkins? Here. Vice Mayor Myers? Here. And Mayor Cummings? Here. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge that the land on which we gather is the unceded territory of the Owaswa speaking Yupi tribe. The Amamutsun tribal band comprised of descendants of indigenous people taken to Mission Santa Cruz and San Juan Batista during Spanish colonization of the Central Coast is today working hard to restore traditional stewardship practices on these lands and heal from historic trauma. So the first um, couple items on our agenda today, we have a few uh, proclamations to make. The first one is proclaiming uh, September is Childhood Cancer Awareness Month. And joining us today is Brittany Maldonado Gosselin, Deputy Director of Jacob's Heart. And so we can start by, uh, I'll start by reading some of the um, language within the proclamation and, um, and then invite up um, Ms. Maldonado to, to speak on behalf of the group. Um, so where is the character? Sorry. Yes. I, it's funny. I just got an email, and it's actually going to be Lori Butterworth from Jacob Tower. Oh, okay. Great. So if Lori Butterworth is on, um, we'll invite you to speak after reading a few of the lines in the proclamation. So where is the character of our community is revealed in how we treat our most vulnerable, and whereas each year one in 285 children in our community are diagnosed with cancer, Whereas cancer remains the leading cause of death by disease among children, more than asthma, diabetes, cystic fibrosis, congenital anomalies, and AIDS combined. And whereas during the COVID-19 pandemic, Jacob's Heart Children's Cancer Support Services has been keeping medically fragile children and families housed, fed, and emotionally supported by steadfastly adhering to the following commitments. One, Parents of children with cancer and other serious illnesses will be relieved of financial fears to be able to focus their attention on their children. Two, no child undergoing intensive treatment in our community will be homeless. Three, families of seriously ill children will not experience food insecurity during and after the pandemic. And four, no seriously ill child in our community will ever miss a medical appointment because of the lack of transportation. And whereas the oncology department at Lucille Packard Children's Hospital at Stanford has worked closely with Jacob's Heart Children's Cancer Support Services for the past 22 years as a trusted community partner in providing family-centered care that addresses the emotional, practical, and financial struggles of families of children with cancer in Santa Cruz, and whereas it is important for all of Santa Cruz residents to recognize the impact of childhood cancer on families within our community, and honor the children in our community whose lives have been cut short by cancer. Now, therefore, I, Justin Cummings, Mayor of the City of Santa Cruz, do hereby proclaim the month of September 2020 is Childhood Cancer Awareness Month in the City of Santa Cruz and encourage all citizens to join me in honoring Jacob's Heart Children's Cancer Support Services for its 22 years of outstanding support to our community and acknowledging its contributions to childhood 
Childhood Cancer Awareness Month. So I'm not sure if someone from Jacob's Heart is on the call. I think she's trying to sign into her audio now. Yeah, it looks like she just signed in. Welcome and thank you for uh, thank you for joining us today. There you go. Let me unmute. Yes, oh, I'm muted. Wait a minute. Uh. Oh, we can hear you. Oh, great, great. Thanks. Sorry, I just got the Zoom link. Hi, everyone. Good to see you. Hi. <laughs> So we just read some language from the proclamation. We're wondering if you'd just like to say a few words about the work that you all are doing. Sure, yeah, especially now during COVID, I think you all can imagine how trying this has been. Um, so the kind of the history of Childhood Cancer Awareness Month, I'll start with that. Um, it started um, in 1999 in a parking lot that used to be, do you remember the old Harley Davidson parking lot? Um, which, yeah, when it, when, it, when it was Harley-Davidson parking lot. We did the mural right there, um, and we collected signatures to declare child, uh, September Childhood Cancer Awareness Month in the state of California, and it was signed then by um, then-Governor Gray Davis. And I'm here in my office, and the original proclamation is hanging on the wall here. I can take you over here to show you. This is the original proclamation signed in 1999. And so we're very proud that our small organization here in Santa Cruz started this groundswell of support and love for children with cancer. So for 22 years, Jacob's Heart has been here supporting kids with cancer and their families. And um, no one could have anticipated what we were going, what was going to befall these children and families this year. Um, I'm sure all of you can imagine that the isolation for families who have a child with cancer right now has intensified, the fear is intensified, and we've lost five precious children to cancer during the during this COVID crisis, and um, it's it's hard to even de de describe what families are going through right now. But at the same time, in the midst of all of that, what we've seen here at Jacob's Heart is an outpouring of love and support from this community like no one could have ever imagined. I've been able to witness it for 22 years, but nothing like this year. People show up with, I mean, the, one of the first things they showed up with was hand sanitizer for every one of our families. Toilet paper, when everybody else was hoarding to toilet paper, some people were bringing it to us. Food, we've been delivering groceries every week um, to the doorsteps of families, and it, the food keeps coming from Samano's Bakery to De La Comena to all these places bring food so we can deliver it to the doorstep so parents don't have to go out and risk going to the grocery store. Masks, you name it, people are thinking of Jacob's Heart, and that really speaks volumes to the community where this started in that parking lot in 1999 for Childhood Cancer Awareness Month to now where this, this month of September we're not able to gather the way we would like to, but the gathering of love and support, we have been able to deliver $125,000 in rent assistance to families mm -hmm. to make sure, not just rent assistance, but also funeral assistance and utilities and, and to pay their bills to, because you know parents are getting laid off and all of that ripple effect. But And what keeps me going and keeps all of us going is at the same time, um, this community cares. And so I can't thank you enough for the proclamation every year. Like we redeclare this because it's important. So um, with that, I just want to say thank you and thanks to this community. There's no better place to live. Thank you for all the amazing work that you all are doing to help these families and these children during such a, a difficult time. Um, I don't know if there's any other council members who wanted to who have any comments that they wanted to make or if they wanted to say anything. Council Member Golder. I just would like to thank um, Lori and all of the people at Jacob's Heart that worked tirelessly for this super important um, organization. And I've been to fundraisers for, I don't even know, probably 18 years, I've been going to different various fundraisers and I always just see the level of um, positivity and 
um, love from the families that are going through this along with other members of the community. And I just, you know, as a lucky parent of two healthy kids, can't imagine what these families that are experiencing this are going through. And I just um, can't thank you and the rest of your organization enough. And I, I know I'm speaking for probably all of us up here, but thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Brown and then Council Member Watkins. I too just want to say thank you for all of the work you do. I I have friends who have uh, uh, been supported by Jacob's Heart and um, just can't thank you enough for all of the work you do. Uh, I wanted to ask if there are ways that people who are listening or watching can support you. What's the best way to do that? Uh, and um, just so we can announce that here and uh, also know for ourselves how to help out. Oh, thank you. Thanks. Thank you for that. Um, so donations are always welcome, especially now. Um, um, like was just mentioned, our events, we haven't, we're not able to have our fundraising events this year. And September and October are always the times when we do that. Mm -hmm. So jacobsheart.org is our website. Um, we are able to have a few volunteers now. We're very careful about that. So there's a whole protocol that we need to go through, but we do need help um, delivering groceries and, and there's training and all that, that that people can do. And also, but um, but really, I think it's the, the the financial support right now, like from you know, 10, 20, 25 dollars, all of that. Um, it's what I want to mention with our grocery deliveries, we found that we spend ten thousand dollars so far this year in in purchasing groceries, but thanks to all of our community partners, that yields uh, ninety seven thousand dollars in worth of food to families um, and it's, so so it's all that so know that you know your donations are going to be really well used and um, and thank you for for allowing me to, to share that so jacobsheart.org and we're um, in Watsonville you can just go, go on the website and find our online donations or um, send a check or you know send if you if you have toilet paper <laughs> we need all of it you know so thank you Great, thank you. Uh, Council Member Watkins. Well, it's nice to see you, Lori, and I, I just I want to echo what was said already, and thank you, Council Member Brown, for asking that question. That was also sort of what I was thinking, is how can we continue to help you? Um, I, I know, I just appreciate you sharing what the community's been able to do to support these families on what I can't imagine as probably their darkest days. But also just having worked alongside you, Lori, for a number of years, I just want to show and express my a deep appreciation for your tireless dedication to this cause, to kids, to families. Um, it, it's, it's, it's inspiring, and we as a community all benefit from it, too. So thank you so much yeah. for all you do. And right back to you all. Thank you so much, Martine. All of you, thank you so much for the work that you do for the community. I mean, this is it's all a labor of love, and we all have our part to play in this extraordinary tapestry called Santa Cruz, you know. <laughs> <laughs> council Member Byers. Oh, thank you. Uh, Lori, I was on the council in 1999. Oh, wow. And I, wow. <laughs> and I, I was, and I so remember your coming, and it was, uh, I mean, I don't remember the details, but uh, it was such a new organization, and look, it is just wonderful. I've been very proud to participate oh, in you. that. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, and, and I do want to mention that back in 1999, um, Melissa McDill, I don't know if many of you knew Missy, um, she was um, board president back then when we were just like a few people and, and working out of my living room. And, you know, she we, she just um, lost her battle to cancer last month, a little over a month ago. And um, it's been a big loss to our organization because she's been around that long. And um, I, I, I'd li like to share that at the same time we lost Missy, Granite Construction actually donated an additional 5,500 square feet to us here um, in, in, with our, our building already at 7,000 square feet free. And so what we're doing now, which I would love the community to get involved in this, is we're preparing a place to come home to for our families when they can return to Jacob's Heart. We will now have over like 15,000 
total square feet. And so we're, we're expanding our counseling program, and we want to expand that out to other organizations who are working with children. And because our children with cancer and their siblings intersect with so many different pieces of it, like to educators, to healers, to counselors, to um, to come and, and let's welcome our community back together when we can. So that all was right there timed at the, and when we lost Missy McDill. So we're naming it the McDill Center for Creative Healing at Jacob's Heart. So I really will make announcements about that, but I'm, I'm glad you brought that up in 1999 because it was her, Missy, and I that were going around getting all those signatures. <laughs> And the Harley guys, too, all those Harley Davidson guys. <laughs> Love it. Yeah, that's a tapestry. We are of Santa Cruz County, right? <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Well, well, thank you again, Lori, for all your hard work, dedication, and commitment to this. And um, we're really happy to be bringing this proclamation forward at this time. Thank you, Lori. Thank you. Thank you so much. Everything you do. All right, so moving on, um, we have the next proclamations we have up. We have four retirement proclamations honoring um, some of our police officers and public safety workers. Uh, the first one that we have is for Larry Emilio, declaring August 31st, 2020 as Larry Emilio Retirement Day. And so I'll read a few lines from this proclamation. On, whereas on August 31st, 2020, Police payroll and purchasing clerk Larry Emilio is retiring after 18 years of faithful and dedicated service to the city of Santa Cruz and its citizens. And whereas on September 4th, 2002, Larry Emilio was hired by the Santa Cruz Police Department as a temporary police records technician. And in February 2003, he was subsequently hired as a permanent employee. And whereas during Larry Emilio's tenure, he served in various roles, including police records technician and most recently police payroll and purchasing clerk. And whereas Larry Emilio has been an outstanding example of loyalty and has been a tremendous asset to the city of Santa Cruz, its community, and its police department, and will long be remembered and appreciated for both his friendship and for his 18 years of commendable service. Now, therefore, I, Justin Cummings, mayor of the city of Santa Cruz, do hereby proclaim August 31st, 2020, as Larry Emilio Retirement Day in the city of Santa Cruz, and encourage all of his coworkers and citizens to join me in expressing heartfelt appreciation for his 18 years of dedicated and exemplary service and numerous contributions to the Santa Cruz Police Department and the city of Santa Cruz, and wishing him well in his retirement. Our next uh, retirement proclamation, and maybe at the end I can open up for council members if they want to say any words um, for police officers who are retiring. Um, but the next um, proclamation is declaring September 4, 2020, as Warren Berry Retirement Day. So I'll re again read a few of the whereas is to the proclamation. Whereas on September 4, 2020, Warren Berry is retiring after 30 years of faithful and dedicated service to the city of Santa Cruz and its citizens. Whereas on April 19, 1990, Warren Berry was hired by the Santa Cruz Police Department as a reserve police officer. In November of 1990, he joined the investigations division as a community service aide. In March of 1993, he joined the patrol division as a community service officer. And in December of 1993, he was sworn in as a, as a police officer within the patrol division. And whereas in December of 2004, Warren Berry was promoted to sergeant in the patrol division and supervised the outset of the parks unit in 2007, he moved into the administrative administration division as sergeant serving in that role until 2012 when he was promoted to lieutenant in patrol, and he remained a lieutenant in patrol until 2018 when he was assigned as lieutenant of investigations and is presently serving in that capacity. Whereas Warren Berry has received numerous commendations, including two chief's commendations, one outstanding police duty award, and a county criminal justice award, and an auto theft recovery award. And whereas Warren Berry is a graduate of Sherman Block 
Supervisors Leadership Institute and the FBI National Academy. And whereas Warren Berry has been an outstanding example of loyalty, has been a tremendous asset to the city of Santa Cruz, its community, and its police department, and will long be remembered and appreciated for both his friendship and for his 30 years of commendable service. Now, therefore, I, Justin Cummings, Mayor of the City of Santa Cruz, do hereby proclaim September 4, 2020, as Warren Berry Retirement Day in the City of Santa Cruz, and encourage all his coworkers and citizens to join me in expressing heartfelt appreciation for his 30 years of dedicated and exemplary service and numerous contributions to the Santa Cruz Police Department and the City of Santa Cruz and wishing him well in his retirement. The next um, retirement proclamation we have is declaring September 4th, 2020 as Dan Flippo Retirement Day. So whereas on September 4th, 2020, Dan Flippo is retiring after 29 years of faithful and dedicated service to the city of Santa Cruz and its citizens. Whereas on March 21st, 1991, Dan Flippo was hired by the Santa Cruz Police Department as a police reserve officer. And in August of 1991, he headed off to the police academy at Galvin College as a trainee. Four months later, he graduated from the police academy. And on December 30th, 1991, he was sworn in as a full-time police officer. Whereas Dan Flippo was assigned to the investigation division as a detective in 2000, and was promoted to the rank of sergeant where he remained from 2000 through 2011 in patrol, downtown patrol, traffic, and streets crimes. In 2012, he was promoted to lieutenant, where he stayed until 2016, when he was promoted to deputy chief of administrations. And earlier this year, he was assigned to deputy chief of operations, overseeing the entire patrol and operations division of the city of Santa Cruz Police Department. And whereas Dan Flippo has devoted the majority of his career to training others, has been recognized as a use of force expert who has given back to the law enforcement community by teaching others to use sound tactics and develop critical decision-making skills. Whereas one of Dan's proudest accomplishments was being one of the developers and founding members of the Santa Cruz Police Department's Emergency Services Unit Tactical Team, of which he was an active member for over 12 years. Whereas Dan Flippo is also honored to have mentored and helped develop others who have gone on to promote to higher ranks within the Santa Cruz Police Department and has been recognized as, a running, as running an efficient department and division. Now, therefore, I, Justin Cummings, Mayor of the City of Santa Cruz, do hereby proclaim September 4, 2020, as Dan Flippo Retirement Day in the City of Santa Cruz and encourage all his coworkers and citizens to join me in expressing a heartfelt appreciation for his 29 years of dedicated and exemplary service and numerous contributions to the Santa Cruz Police Department and the City of Santa Cruz and wishing him well in his retirement. And our last retirement proclamation uh, is proclaiming September 10, 2020, as Marilyn Berry Retirement Day. Whereas on September 10th, 2020, police records technician Marilyn Berry is retiring after 29 years of faithful and dedicated service to the city of Santa Cruz and its citizens. And whereas on March 16th, 1991, Marilyn Berry was hired by the Santa Cruz Police Department as a police radio dispatcher. In June of that year, she was hired as a crossing guard and served in that role for two years. Whereas in September of 2000, Marilyn Berry made her way as a community service aide before becoming a police records technician in January of 2002 for the Santa Cruz Police Department's Records Division, a role that she has served in for 18 years and will proudly retire from. Whereas Marilyn Berry has been an outstanding example of loyalty and has been tremendous, a tremendous asset to the city of Santa Cruz, its community, and its police department, and will long be remembered and appreciated for both, for both her friendship and for her 29 years of commendable service. Now, therefore, I, Justin Cummings, Mayor of the City of Santa Cruz, do hereby proclaim September 10, 2020, as Marilyn Berry Retirement Day in the City of Santa Cruz. Encourage all her coworkers and citizens to join me in expressing heartfelt appreciation 
for her 29 years of dedicated and exemplary service and numerous contributions to the Santa Cruz Police Department and the city of Santa Cruz and wishing her well in her retirement. And as mayor, I would just like to say thank you so much um, for all these officers who have dedicated so much time and, and so much of their lives to serving uh, the city of Santa Cruz. Um, I know that it's, it's oftentimes difficult to find good officers to join our department, let alone those who will stay for 20 to 30 years. And so I just want to thank um, those officers who are um, going into the retirement. I want to wish you all well. And I'd like to invite any of our council members to speak, um, should they be interested in doing so. Councilmember Watkins and Councilmember Golder. Thank you, Mayor. I'll just echo your comments of appreciation for their years of dedicated service to our city and also just how challenging these circumstances are because um, having served as mayor, being able to actually go and celebrate and have these moments of appreciation in person, you know, it's hard. You, you just can't replace that. So, um, you know, in a virtual way, uh, I hope we as a community can celebrate their years of service and, um, and thank you for sharing those proclamations. Councilmember Golder. I was going to echo what um, Councilmember Watkins said and also in that it's probably not the way you pictured retiring um, after all of your years of dedication and service to the city, but it didn't go unnoticed, all your hard work, and we appreciate everything that you've done for us over the years, and we hope you have a long and happy um, years of travel and fun things ahead. And um, as soon as we're out of COVID and um, look forward to seeing you enjoying the beach and doing other fun things. Vice Mayor Myers. Yeah, I just wanted to also echo my appreciation. Um, it's quite a day for our police department to live so much um, decades of experience um, and for, for people who have really dedicated their lives to serving the people of Santa Cruz. And uh, I just wish you and your families all the best and um, hope you enjoy everything you plan to do in retirement. And uh, I wish we could be having a big celebration right now, but um, please just know that we appreciate everything you've done and all the time you've uh, given to our community. So thank you. Councilmember Matthews. Well, I didn't do the math as you were reading the uh, proclamation, but it's, it's well over a century of service, I think. <laughs> between these four people. And interestingly enough, two of them that we would say kind of behind the scenes doing the nuts and bolts work of the police department and and two very visible um, um, people who have risen over time uh, to become real leaders in the department. And I realized as you were reading those that um, their tenure in the department kind of overlaps with mine, <laughs> the city, and it's, it's really, um, it's wonderful to see people who are so dedicated and who feel called to this work, uh, who have such a sense of professionalism and uh, very real connection to community, um, 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 dedicate that career to our city. And it certainly has shown the quality of their work and also the appreciation that I think is widely held in the community for all the work they've done. And I echo whoever said, uh, you know, one of the things about retirement in the age of COVID is, boy, you <laughs> miss those retirement parties where you can get, get together in person and thank people for their work. But um, um, really, uh, um, thank you so much to, to all these people. Councilmember Brown. Yeah, hi, I just wanted to say thank you for your service to all of those who are retiring now in these very uh, strange times. And, um, you know, I know that when Deputy 
Chief uh, Martinez retired, he, he was able to come to the council meeting and, and talk with us and address us. And that it was really great to hear from him. We don't always hear directly from uh, folks over in PD. And um, so while we are not getting a chance to hear from you here today, I just wanted to thank you all for your service. And um, it's I, I actually did the math, Cynthia, and it was 106 years total here that we've got. <laughs> um, and, um, you know, and, and well-deserved retirement. Well, for all those officers, again, thank you for your service. I know it's not an easy job, but you all stuck it out for the long haul with this community, and we very much appreciate um, your time and service. And so with that, we have one more proclamation to give today. Um, I'm going to invite um, Denise Elric to accept this proclamation declaring September, oops, no, not September 10th, um, declaring August 31st as Overdose, Overdose Awareness Day. And so I'll read some of the um, whereases for this. Whereas the city of Santa Cruz does affirm and acknowledge that harm, the harm that results from drug overdose. And whereas the city of Santa Cruz supports the purpose of International Overdose Awareness Day, by both remembering loved ones lost to overdose and enhancing empathy for people that are impacted by substance abuse. And whereas we resolve to commit to reducing the toll of overdose in our community, in 2019, accidental drug overdose claimed the lives of 57 people in Santa Cruz County, with countless more people affected forever. And whereas we affirm that people affected by overdose are sons, daughters, mothers and fathers, brothers and sisters, coworkers, neighbors, and friends, deserving of our love, compassion, and support. And whereas we will do all we can to increase empathy and decrease stigma, and whereas we resolve to support evidence-based strategies as outlined by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention that include targeted naloxone distribution, medicated-assisted treatment, 911 Good Samaritan laws, naloxone distribution in treatment settings and in criminal justice settings, medication-assisted treatment in criminal, in criminal justice settings, and upon release, initiating medical assistant treatment in emergency departments and supporting syringe services programs. Now, therefore, I, Justin Cummings, Mayor of the City of Santa Cruz, do hereby proclaim August 31st, 2020, as Overdose Awareness Day in the City of Santa Cruz, and ask all residents to work together to help end negative stigmas associated with addiction and support programs that help members of our community overcome addiction. And I'd like to invite uh, Denise Elric to say a few words on behalf of the Harm Reduction Coalition of Santa Cruz County. Thank you. Um, can you hear me? Yep. Oh, great. Thank you very, very much, Mayor Cummings um, and council members. And um, I'm speaking to you today as the founder of the Harm Reduction Coalition of Santa Cruz County. But I also, um, with a mayor, with former Mayor Watkins, we have served together on community prevention partners who are also play a role in International Overdose Awareness Day, um, as well as um, I'm a member of the SafeRx Coalition for Santa Cruz County, who's been working for years to decrease um, opioid, opioid prescribing practices, among other things. Um, and every year we host an event on August 31st together, and typically they're in the park and we make prayer flags like you see behind me that we hang at the CERN Services Program now. We um, gather with people that have lost a cousin or a family member. But this year we had to do it over Zoom, which had its negative impacts, but it also had some positive impacts in that we gathered over 100 people. Um, some family members from as far as Texas and San Diego were able to dial in. Um, we hosted um, a lovely event with Gail Newell and Melissa Etheridge as our guest speakers, who you both know have lost a son to a preventable overdose. And I really want to thank you, Mayor Cummings and Council Member Brown, also especially for your courageous support of us, the Harm Reduction Coalition um, of Santa Cruz County, in an effort to return 
modern um, syringe access and disposal to what it once was, which was evidence-based and far-reaching and peer-supported. Um, I also want to thank you, Mayor Cummings in particular, for um, signing on to a recent op-ed that was published in the Pajaronian with other mayors, uh, Kristen Peterson in Capitola and Rebecca Garcia in Watsonville. And the, the subject of the op-ed was really to address stigma and empathy for people that live with substance use disorder. And the title of the op-ed was Words Matter. And I, I just want to read a small segment of that, and then I will move on. Um, I did have to put things in writing to protect you all from me rambling on or from me forgetting tongue-tied. So excuse me if I read. Um, but here's, here's a quote from the op-ed. Um, there has been attention and commentary in both the media and social groups in Santa Cruz County regarding words to describe those who suffer from substance use disorders in less than favorable terms. Words such as junkie, drug seeker, criminal-like, addict, all add to the stigma associated with substance use. Addiction is a diagnose, diagnosis characterized by compulsive drug use despite negative consequences. The people, as you said, who use drugs are our neighbors, fathers, mothers, children, and in essence, they are your constituents. As difficult as it is to live with a chronic, potentially relapsing disease, the impacts of stigma can be devastating. Public stigma leads to barriers in, of employment, education, training, health, housing, and social support. And personal stigma leads to shame and guilt, lowered self-esteem, and what's very important, it leads to delays in seeking help and poorer health outcomes. Stigma involves many labels negative stereotypes and dehumanization that impact social and health outcomes. We strongly urge and implore the community to move to a model of person-first language, to humanize people rather than stigmatizing languages that have severe negative outcomes. I'm very thankful that the city of Santa Cruz has moved forward and has adopted a health and all policy framework and adopting first-person language is very much aligned with this policy. I just really want to thank you from the bottom of my harm reductionist heart for your proclamation of support. And I can assure you that the Harm Reduction Coalition, as well as SafeRx and Community Prevention Partners, will gladly work together with the City of Santa Cruz. Um, COVID-19 plus the recent fire disasters combined with an opioid use epidemic that has reduced the life expectancy of a generation nationally has undoubtedly had negative impacts on the overdose risk in the city of Santa Cruz. And I will resend last year's report to you on the um, Sheriff Coroner's update of the 2008 to 18 overdose data. It's very useful and suffice to say that the city that you serve has the highest rate of fatal, fatal overdoses anywhere in the county. And that's been consistent for numerous years. Um, and the questions that I would like the council to be asking themselves is, can, as you support a health and health policies framework, how can we reduce preventable overdose deaths? Is all of the recommendations that you mentioned that are recommended by the CDC, it's no one magic bullet. It's going to be a collaborative effort. Um, I only wish Jen Hastings was here with me because without their steadfast, rock solid, door knocking, pavement pounding work, we wouldn't have um, medication-assisted treatment in the jails, the um, ED bridge that she's instrumental, that they are instrumental on. Um, so I will let you know that next week on September 15th, the Integrated Behavioral Health and Action Coalition will meet, and there will be a meeting with the 2019 overdose trends and data, and our speakers at that meeting will be Jen Hastings, Dr. Stephanie Fiore, Gail Newell and Dr. Gillarducci. I will forward you a link to that event in case you need one more Zoom meeting to attend. But that's always a powerful, contemplative 
meeting and it'll also have kind of a projection for 2020 because we are in a strange time and nationally we already know that 35 states are re re reporting um, surges in fatal overdose deaths. So um, on that note, I just want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for acknowledging this real issue that we face as a community um, and that is um, overdose and we can reduce overdose, we can eliminate fatal overdoses. It's not going to be easy, but it's a heavy lift, but it's worth it. It's really worth it. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you. Um, I don't know if there's any anything that com any comments from council members? Council Member Brown. Yeah, I'll just really quickly say thank you, Denise, for joining us and talking about this issue. Uh, thank you for all the work you do. And I just wanna give uh, a really sincere thanks to the, the folks who work with the Harm Reduction Coalition in Santa Cruz County. Um, I, I know many of you as uh, friends, neighbors, and, um, and I just know how much you care about uh, people and about our community and, and really doing the right thing to help uh, uh, alleviate suffering, really, and, um, and the pain that um, comes with addiction. So um, just wanted to say that and uh, keep on doing the good work. Thank really you, appreciate thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Watkins. Yeah, thank you, Mayor, and thank you, Denise, and I think it's really important to, to bring up awareness and, and also really highlighting what you shared, which is the work of the Community Prevention Partnership and how are we also working to ensure that our kids are provided uh, with the best opportunities to thrive and not to actually uh, go down a path of addiction, ideally. And so how do we even think about things more even upstream and uh, preventing uh, drug use from the very beginning? And I think it's the holistic uh, bits that uh, Lori mentioned earlier in terms of how we can work together to improve the health of our entire community. So thank you for that. And thank you, Mayor. All right, seeing no further comments, uh, Denise, thank you again for bringing this to our attention, and um, thank you for all the work that you all are doing to try to prevent overdose deaths in, in our city and throughout our county. I think it's really important that we try to you know, continue getting people on a pathway of recovery and changing the way that we refer to people and making them feel like they can get services when it's needed is, one of the, is a very big step in that direction. So, and also, I think prevention is, is key to all of this as well. So thank you for all the work that you all do. And um, with that, we'll, uh, we'll continue on with our meeting. So um, I have a few announcements and then we will move on to our regular meeting. Today's meeting again is being broadcast on community television, channel 25, and streaming on the city's website, cityofsantacruz.com. If you wish to comment on an agenda item today, Instructions are provided on your screen. We will provide these instructions throughout the meeting whenever we move on to an agenda item that will be opened up for public comment. Please note that public comment is only heard on items that council is taking action on and not regular updates and reports. The items that will be opened up for public comment during today's meetings are items numbers 12 through 26 on our agenda. I'd like to ask if there's any disqualifications or statements of disqualification today. Okay, hearing none, I'd like to ask the clerk uh, to announce any additions or deletions. Um, yes, thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> At the uh, recommendation of the city attorney with um, concurrence from the director of Parks and Recreation, Tony Elliott, um, item number 25, which is the Parks Master Plan 2030 and Environmental Impact Report is deleted from the agenda. So, um, pardon, pardon the interruption, Mayor, but I would just like to clarify that <clears throat> it will be continued to the meeting of October 13th. And uh, in the meantime, we'll be referred back to the Parks and Recreation Commission for uh, further discussion at its September 14th meeting. Okay, thank you very much for that deletion and for that information. 
Um, next on our agenda, oral communications. I just have to make an announcement on that. Um, just like to make an announcement on that. Oral communications is an opportunity for members of the public uh, to speak to us on items that are not on our agenda. Oral communications will occur immediately after agenda item number 26. So if you wish to make a comment during oral communications, please call in towards the end of item number 26. Next item on our agenda is uh, city attorney report on closed session. So I'd like to call on the city attorney to provide a report on closed session items from today. Yes, thank you, Mayor Cummings, members of the city council. Uh, this afternoon, the council uh, closed at 12 p.m. to discuss uh, liability claims and pending litigation matters only. Uh, item one was liability claims, the claims of Ruben Farnsworth, Progressive Insurance and Deborah Workman. Uh, the first of those, uh, the first two of those, the Ruben Farnsworth claim and the Progressive Insurance claim are also listed on your consent calendar this afternoon as item number 15. Uh, there was no reportable action on the third claim of Deborah Workman. Uh, next, the council uh, considered uh, pending litigation matters. Item 2A was the case National Urban League, et cetera, versus Wilbur J. Ross et al., a case pending in the United States District Court for the Northern District of California. In that case, the council, by a unanimous vote, authorized the city to join in an amicus brief that is uh, being filed by the County of Santa Clara in this lawsuit, which challenges a decision by the uh, Department of Commerce and the Census Bureau to cut short a bureau uh, non-response follow-up efforts. Uh, these are efforts that the Census Bureau typically does when it has canvassed an area and identified uh, individuals or households that have not responded to the census. Um, the uh, the non-response follow-up efforts uh, this census uh, year were delayed because of the COVID-19 crisis and uh, earlier in the year, the Trump administration and the Census Bureau announced that they would be, in light of the, the suspension of those efforts, would be extending the deadline for non-response follow-up efforts to the end of October. And then just recently, the Census Bureau announced that it would, it, that it had rescinded that extension and was going back to the current deadline or the initial deadline, which was September 30th. Um, I might add that last Friday, in the U.S. District Court uh, in San Jose, uh, Judge Lisa Coe granted a temporary restraining order against the Census Bureau's uh, operational changes, and a further hearing on a preliminary injunction in that matter is, is currently scheduled for September 17th, uh, at which time the plaintiffs will be uh, uh, requesting a, a preliminary injunction to, again, extend the uh, deadline for the cutoff of the non-response follow-up efforts to the to the census process. Item 2B is a trio of cases entitled Commonwealth of Pennsylvania et al. versus Lewis DeJoy et al. That's a case pending in the Eastern District Court of Pennsylvania, the United States District Court in the Eastern District of Pennsylvania. Second case is entitled the State of New York versus Donald J. Trump and that is a case pending in the District of Columbia, uh, United States District Court. The third case is entitled the State of Washington versus Donald J. Trump, and that is a case that's pending in the uh, Eastern District of Washington in the United States District Court. And, and again, the council unanimously authorized the city to join in an amicus brief being filed on behalf of the County of Santa Clara and the Public Rights Project, which is representing the city of Columbus, Ohio. Uh, this lawsuit challenges operational changes at the U.S. Postal Service that have uh, already delayed mail delivery and that appear to be part of a Trump administration attempt to suppress voting by mail uh, ballot, which during the pandemic has increased by over 400 percent um, compared to uh, prior presidential primary elections. And these measures include eliminating overtime, uh, eliminating trips to postal sorting facilities to pick up mail for delivery. Um, the notorious removing mail sorting machines from certain lo localities and, and prioritizing election ballots from the first-class mail uh, process, all of which appear to 
uh, be intended to um, uh, voter turnout and mail ballot voting in the upcoming presidential election. So again, the council unanimously authorized the city to join in an amicus brief being prepared uh, in those three matters. And uh, there was no further reportable action. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, next on our agenda is the city manager report. I'd like to call on the city manager to provide updates on city events and business items. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I just had a couple of updates. Uh, first, as it relates to the um, pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic, and then some updates on the uh, CCU lightning complex fires. So first, with respect to the um, COVID-19 pandemic response, uh, the governor did announce today, uh, you may have heard, that Santa Cruz County has now been moved to the red tier. Uh, which lessens some economic restrictions. So beginning today, personal care services such as waxing, nails, and massage, restaurants, places of worship, movie theaters, gyms, and fitness centers, along with museums, zoos, and aquarium, aquariums will be open, will be able to open indoors with modifications to protect the health and safety of staff and the public. And. Uh, but I also wanted to point out that uh, the health department has also warned that uh, the community should be aware that another surge of COVID-19 cases is anticipated. Nonetheless, uh, this is due to evacuations uh, from the fire, which resulted in many people mixing with others uh, from outside and inside their household. So if the case uh, count does go up, Santa Cruz County could return to the purple tier in 14 days. So we'll have to see how long we can stay in the, uh, in the red tier. Uh, school openings for in-person instruction can only be considered once a county has been in the red tier for 14 days uh, and are subject to decisions by local school boards and administrators. So at this point, no county schools may open for in-person instruction at this time. So that's the situation with respect to the schools. Uh, the other thing that occurred this weekend were the beach closures, and I can tell you that uh, our preliminary information uh, that I've received thus far is that they were pretty quiet this weekend. We didn't really have any major incidences or large crowds, so that's, that's good from the perspective of uh, preventing the uh, virus the spread. Uh, that probably was attributable to the, the, the dual county, Santa Cruz and Monterey County closure of beaches, as well as state parks uh, beaches, and also I imagine the, uh, the fires probably played a role with respect to reducing crowds. So with respect to, to, to on that front, uh, I think we did pretty well, didn't have any major problems uh, that we can report at this time. So that's the uh, pandemic uh, updates. Now with respect to the fires, um, I'm just gonna point out a couple of fire response activities and I'm, then I'm gonna turn it over to Jason uh, Hyduke, our fire chief, who can give you an update on the overall fire uh, and then Rosemary may want to comment also on, on the water system related issues. Uh, so a couple of activities, fire response activities that are happening in the city. First, uh, as you all know, the county did open a resource uh, recovery center or, or recovery resource center in the city at the uh, arena. That was opened on August 29th and it's open from 11 to 7 p.m. And that is a, a way for residents that are impacted by the fire to connect to resources and services so they can help to recover and rebuild. So that's operating right now. And then with respect to shelter sites, the county did consolidate shelter facilities, uh, which included uh, reducing or closing some facilities as the uh, number of evacuees declined uh, with reopenings of uh, communities. And so the Civic Auditorium Evacuation Center was closed along with uh, uh, others in the county. However, sites do remain open and those include the Santa Cruz County Fairgrounds in Watsonville, the Seventh-day Adventist Conference Grounds in Soquel, uh, Cabrillo College in Aptos, Harbor High School here in Santa Cruz, and the Simpkins Family Swim Center in Live Oak. So those are still uh, available uh, for evacuees. Uh, and so now I'll turn it over to uh, Jason and then uh, Rosemary after that. Good afternoon, Mary Cummings and City Council, Jason Hyduke, your fire chief. So brief update on the CZU fire. Uh, the good news is uh, as of this morning, it's 81% contained. 
and it's a, just over 86,000 acres in total. Uh, that containment number will go up, uh, and primarily those, uh, those lines of containment are in the Boulder Creek and the Pescadero, Utano area. It's incredibly steep terrain, um, and they've uh, really uh, been aggressive about repopulating those areas when the infrastructure can't support it. Um, at this point, and the number of people who are assigned to the incident is decreasing. Um, I'm sure you're aware that the state as a whole has a number of very large-scale fire in incidents that are occurring right now. Um, unfortunately, this fire did have uh, one fatality associated with it. But I will say that given the, uh, the scope of this fire and the area that it was in, being able to evacuate that number of people uh, that quickly and not having uh, more significant injuries or fatalities is an absolute success. Um, there's just under 1,500 structures that have been just uh, destroyed. The majority of those are in the county of Santa Cruz, and uh, they are in the process of uh, assessing all of those, those areas. Um, the, the recovery from this is going to be a very long, ongoing process, uh, and primarily not just rebuilding of homes, and getting people back into their their, their uh, structures, but the infrastructure. There's really significant damage to uh, power lines, to the water systems, and that's one of the things that's holding up the repopulation of these areas uh, so that people have a place to go back to that's safe. But also uh, traveling on those roads, they're narrow two-lane roads, and there's a lot of heavy equipment um, as those uh, people are back in there doing that infrastructure. Um, I expect that they'll have full containment on this shortly, but one word um, I, I do want to, um, that containment is just contained. There's a number of interior uh, pockets or vegetation that will smoke and be on fire until we get significant rain, and that's going to be an ongoing uh, issue um, for all the people in that area as they go back. So the good news is we uh, they, ha they have good containment on, on this fire. Um, I expect they'll have full containment here in the near future. Um, the bad news is, is it's going to be a long road to a full recovery for all the people that have been impacted here within our county. Thanks, Tisa. Go ahead, um, So I'd like to share my screen. Um, uh, are you seeing my screen? Yes? No? No. Hold on a second. Sorry. Rosemary, I know you have it saved, so if you want me to share mine, let me know. Yeah. Uh, Bonnie, maybe you could do that for me on the P on the M drive. Sorry, I don't know what's going on with this today. Um, a couple of things. I've got a, a number of slides here, and I intend to go fairly quickly, but um, we have been getting some um, requests and some concerns expressed by the um, by members of the community about water quality in particular. But I would really like to um, to talk a, a couple of minutes about, um, yeah, that's not it. It's the other one, I think, uh, Bonnie. Uh, I would really like to talk about the, um, the issues associated with the, the work that's been being done by the work team. There we go. The um, water resources, the watershed, uh, emergency response team, and um, to to talk a little bit about kind of where we've been and where we're going. Uh, so maybe we could back up a couple of slides here. Are we on some kind of? Uh, yeah, hold on a second. Yeah. So where we've been fundamentally is we did quite a bit of work in uh, right before the meeting that we had two weeks ago to get our facilities ready, and I have a couple of photos that show a big fire break on the west side of the ridge associated with um, with the um, Loch Lomond, the Mill Creek watershed. And as a result of making those fire breaks, uh, not gonna work today. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, next slide, please. There you go. This is a fire break that was put in on the west side of the Mill Creek watershed, and the, the, now we need to go in and put in water bars so that during the rainy season we don't have basic more flooding and, and erosion of these areas. So this is a sort of hardening. The same is true for, particularly for, next slide, Bonnie, that, um, 
the Graham Hill Water Treatment Plant, quite a bit of vegetation uh, management was done there, removal. And now we've got, particularly on the steep slopes, the downhill side of this, we've got to put in some drainage structures to make sure we don't lose the hillside during the upcoming rain. Um, go ahead. Um, but really, um, among the main things that I, I want to be talking about here are the fact that um, high water quality continues to be an ongoing focus. And I don't expect anybody to go ahead to the next slide to um, be able to read all the detail here. But this is an example of the kind of work that we're doing in terms of the water quality monitoring, the parameters that are being tested. There's another slide beyond this that shows even more um, areas that we're doing ongoing monitoring for some of the big examples of concern are uh, benzene, which is uh, associated with the, um, the melted HBT, HDPE pipe up in the upper part of the watershed in the Boulder Creek water system. But fundamentally, we are doing even more monitoring than we would normally do, and you can see pretty much any kind of parameter on this, from the organic chemicals to the inorganic chemicals, metals and to biologicals that we are focusing on. And so we will continue to be using that information, collecting even more than usual and using it and making decisions about how we operate the water system. Go ahead, Bonnie. Um, the big issue, and I think Jason maybe sort of, uh, next one um, after that, that, Jason sort of mentioned this is, can you click on this link for me, please? It's the debris flows and um, and and uh, source of uh, contamination coming into the system. If it works, we should be able to see a, a, a small clip from the USGS that it's not going to work. I don't see the little thing going around. The USGS has a really interesting little um, clip of a uh, an area in Orange County that burned a couple of years ago that they put a rain uh, intensity camera on. And so once you see that within three minutes, the stream starts to flow full of debris and um, runoff from the area that is uh, that's affected by the rainfall. Go ahead, Bonnie, we'll just skip that. Um, so this is what a normal situation would look like. The, the rain would fill, infiltrate into the ground and run uh, subsurface into the stream beds, but under the, um, the post-fire conditions, go ahead, post-fire conditions, it's not what happens. The, the fire uh, makes the soil uh, impervious to infiltration. And so you end up getting quite a bit of debris that comes into the system and then washes down the stream. And go ahead, Bonnie. Um, this is what we're really concerned about coming forward. In the San Lorenzo River, we have that issue there. We know we have burn area in the Laguna watershed. Majors and Lydell seem not to be affected at this point, but we are concerned about what will happen once the rain comes. One more, please. Um, again, this is a map I showed you the last time that kind of showed the perimeter of the fire in the kind of late August and the, per, the portion of the fire area that is in the San Lorenzo watershed, the source of about 45% of our total supply. Go ahead. And the, the, uh, this is an area between um, Majors and Laguna, just above the Laguna Diversion. So this is the kind of prime area we don't have a lot of photos of these areas yet because we're, we've not been able to get access, but this is a prime area where we're concerned about uh, debris flows and sedimentation and sediment transport, water quality impacts. Go ahead. Um, so the, the work team that came in and started working, it really does look at debris flow, um, flooding, rockfall, values at risk. Um, go ahead. And they assess the soil burn severity um, they develop a lot of different kinds of maps and some really interesting uh, products that are being developed. And Mayor Cummins also sent us a product that he and the folks up in uh, UCSC that he works in is looking at the fire intensities. And these are all tools that really will help us both target um, restoration work, but also be prepared for what might be coming as far as um, debris flows and other kind of issues in the future. Go ahead, Bonnie. Uh, this is a map from a, a, the Napa Sonoma area and a fire that occurred a number of years ago that uh, shows the burn severity. 
and you can kind of see the the orangey colors of which there's a little bit up here in the top of the, the photo of the map um, is the most um, severely impacted. But even so, you get other kinds of problems associated with these, um, these things that you'll see in the next couple of slides. So go ahead, please. This is a similar map looking at the before and after. I think that this is uh, sediment transport surface erosion in a um, tons per acre. And in the pre-fire, which is the image on the uh, left-hand side, you can see that the average is about a quarter of a ton per acre with the pre-fire. Post-fire, you will see that it's 12 tons per acre with a 50% or greater probability that this would happen in any given year. So this is a pretty significant issue if it starts to really occur in, uh, the, particularly in the San Lorenzo watershed as a result of the burns that have occurred on the west side of that basin. Go ahead. Um, and this is a, an example of the kind of uh, rainfall intensity. This is in inches per hour uh, against the kind of flows that you could see. And it's pretty common for us to see rainfall events that take the flows in the San Lorenzo from 100 CFS, which is the, the scale over here on the vertical axis, to you know six or eight or even a thousand, um, two thousand, twenty thousand, and if we get these kinds of rain events this uh, this winter, and we do have severe burn areas, we're going to have more uh, significant flows, and we're going to have more runoff um, changes from the burn areas that are going to affect our water quality, and so that's a big concern for us. Go ahead, Bonnie. Um, these are the maps I wanted to mention to you um, that uh, that Mayor Cummings and his uh, folks that he works with at um, at UCSC provided us with. It's um, it was some really good imaging from um, satellite views about the burn areas. You can see in the image on the right hand side, the high burn areas are mostly in the uh, on the west side watersheds, which are a concern to us relative to majors and. Um, to Lydell and to um, Laguna sources of supply, whereas some of the lower intensity burns are more in the San Lorenzo Basin. And you'll kind of imagine that kind of where the this green block uh, in the in this map on the uh, in this image on the right hand sort of separates the upper part of the basin that it's probably not so much affecting us versus the San Lorenzo Basin. So we've been pretty lucky in the sense that not so much of the area has had the really, really intense burns that we saw uh, on the west side watershed. So that's a that's a good sign for us, but still uh, something to be cautious about. Go ahead, Bonnie. Um, so the word uh, the word effort that's been underway, maybe actually just getting uh, completed, will help us to identify. Um, mitigation efforts and restoration efforts and help us to focus those efforts in a very uh, timely way so that we can use the next couple of months before we really get the more likely uh, portion of the rainy season, get some uh, steps in place to help mitigate some of those impacts coming. Go ahead. And uh, I used a number of the slides from uh, this in this presentation from they were from a presentation by Druco to a meeting up at the Sonoma uh, watershed area. Um, so I wanted to acknowledge that work. And uh, with that, I can take your questions if you have any. Thank you all for those presentations. Um, do any council members have questions for Rosemary or for um, Chief Hyduk or for the city manager? I should, I should say one more thing, and that is that there's, you know, there's a lot of effort that going on right now to find funding to um, make sure that we have the money to um, do the restoration that we need to do. And so um, I know that we and others are coordinating to work with folks in Sacramento and with FEMA to make sure that the restoration, uh, the money that we need will be forthcoming and that it won't all necessarily have to come out of our local coffers. Thanks, Rosemary. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Matthews. 
that kind of related to the question that was in my mind is this just blew your budget and your work program completely to pieces <laughs> if you didn't have enough going on. So, yeah. Um, any comment? I mean, on I that? think that there's the an one thing that the, the one thing I think that for us is we do have an emergency fund, um, a reserve that we can draw on, and particularly if it's a, a timing issue for getting some things done and then maybe getting reimbursement down the road, which I think is often the FEMA strategy, right? And we're working really hard to uh, collect our information. We've got staff who've been pulling together a 20-some a page document to come up with recommendations both on restoration, on source monitoring, and how to make sure that we get early warning in the event that there's a problem coming our way. Uh, one of the big issues with a lot of uh, debris flows is that our intake at uh, the Tate Street, you know, the, the Coast Pump Station there on Tate Street could be blocked. And so thinking about contingency plans and also thinking about ways to manage water quality and to produce and deliver, uh, you know, a quality product when there is a uh, a, a source water change, and so the treatment side of it is being looked at as well. And we've got a lot of people putting our intention on that, but the goal is really a you know a focus in the next 60 to 75 days on those issues, and we'll sort of have to work at other things around it. But yeah, Rosemary, I had a quick question, just kind of on the um, the restoration. So, because I know oftentimes, you know, restorate like ecological restoration in these areas can take, you know, a yeah. long time. And so I was just kind of curious what, if there are any types of kind of mitigation efforts that can be put in place to kind of slow the flow of a lot of that sediment. And yeah, just kind of curious. <laughs> The work team have some, uh, they, they have a lot of experience with those kinds of things. And I, in the presentation, I didn't use every slide from that presentation. There were some examples of sort of temporary kind of cop dams kind of put up in places to, you know, create a, a little bit of a place for the water to slow down. Um, again, I think for us, the, the work team's report, and then um, as I think I mentioned to you in a, you know, an email the other day, getting some visual sense of what the, is going on in the watershed areas that have been burned over um, is really helpful. The, um, and we're seeing in some of the aerials that we've seen so far that there's kind of spots that are burned and then other spots that aren't burned. And if that's the case, that's probably a slightly better situation then uh, the alternative where everything is gone, they don't all look like that photo that I showed you from the Laguna area, so to speak. And so, you know, really getting a sense of where the big drainages come from. The west side of the San Lorenzo watershed tends to be, uh, you know, more granitic soils. And so a little bit more stable, maybe less likely to have so much sloughing. Uh, but we have a lot to learn, and we're obviously focused on trying to gather information and process it and make plans that can start getting put on the ground fairly quickly. Great. Thank you. Uh, Vice Mayor Myers. Yeah, um, I was just going to add um, I'm impressed that the work, work team is already out, and um, uh, just some, from some experiences, you know, 10, 12 years ago in Big Sur um, with some severe fire with r really rugged terrain. I was really impressed working with those folks, um, trying to manage a few properties through some of those issues, including properties that had um, domestic water systems on them. Um, just very okay. impressed with the level of, of commitment and follow-up and knowledge that those teams bring. and. Um, you know, there we were able to avoid a number of what we thought would be really devastating debris flows just by working with that team and really understanding the the, the risk and how to manage the landscape. So uh, I'm really glad to hear they're already on the ground and uh, especially right now before it gets too late in the season. So, um, and I know, Rosemary, you have really good watershed practitioners on your staff, some of the best. So. Um, Will you, I guess my one question is, with all the efforts that we have been putting into the HCP um, and knowing that fish flows is one of our major accomplishments over the last 10 years, really, 
but also going further into some of the restoration work that's gone on over the last few decades. Um, how's your fisheries team feeling about um, sort of this pivotal time right now where we're going to, you know, we've been trying to enhance habitat. We've seen some good results, obviously, mm -hmm. in the lagoon, but also up in the watershed. Um, do you, is your fishery staff able to kind of get an assessment of how to manage through the winter quite yet? Well, we don't, we're not quite there, but that certainly is on our mind. And um, Chief Heidegg reminded me that when the work team is finished, that the whole sort of report comes to the local uh, agencies to, um, you know, coordinate implementation. And so we have already uh, been in contact with the county uh, regarding, you know, the water resources side of it and their fisheries person along with ours and the water resources management people along with our folks are certainly, you know, getting ready to dig into what the strategies need to be and how to do the best we possibly can um, for, you know, those resources, all the resources we that are uh, values at risk in this situation. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, it's uh, all of our all of our water supply streams are all steelhead streams and coho salmon too. So you've got a you've got a real balancing act of really trying to really protect those resources over the last decade. But now now uh, trying to understand how to manage those watersheds will be interesting. So thanks, and yeah. please express to your staff um, just a lot of appreciation for for all the uh, work they're doing right now. So thank you. And thank you, Mayor. Councilmember Watkins. Well, I'll just echo the appreciation of the work that's being done. And um, I know it's going to be a quick moving process in terms of just how we can stay informed about what's happening. And, and if it's just these updates um, during the city manager reports, that's really helpful because I know a lot of people are thinking about this, especially as we're looking towards the winter months. Um, but, you know, we still have a lot of fall dry weather ahead of us as well. Yeah. Uh, I guess I have a quick question, maybe more for, for um, kind of the, the length of impact of having a lot of the residents from the valleys in our communities. And I'm so grateful that we have the uh, Kaiser Permanente Center open. Um, what is the staffing and needs of that center and how long do you anticipate it remaining open to serve those evacuees? So thus, thus far, the, the county is operating the facility, um, and uh, so they're using a combination, I think, of volunteers, a variety of different organizations that are uh, supporting uh, and functioning in the facility, uh, as well as county staff so, so far. So the city, uh, they have, it hasn't required city staff to, to participate in so far as operating the, the, the center, the assistance center. Uh, and then as far, I'm not actually, I don't know exactly what their time frame is, but um, I believe that uh, there it's, uh, they haven't announced uh, when it'll, it will close. Um, and so I think they're, they're looking at just continuing to operate as long as there's a, a need and assistance that's required. And it has been quite uh, used quite a bit actually, just from observing the, uh, the traffic and, and the people going and coming to, to the facility. So it has been has taken quite a bit of use this. Great. Well, thank you. Okay, there's no further questions from council members on this item. I just want to thank um, our water director, our fire chief, all their staff for all the hard work that they're doing, um, our city manager's office, and everyone in the community who's really been stepping up um, under this really difficult time during an already difficult time. So um, thank you all for the hard work that you're doing, and um, please let us know if there's anything we can do to help support you all. Thank you. Okay, the next item on our agenda is the City Council uh, will review the meeting calendar. I'd like to call on the City Clerk to provide any updates to the calendar. There are no updates. Thank you, Mayor. Okay. Um, next item on our agenda, um, this is an opportunity for council members to report out on actions at external boards, committees, joint power authorities, um, and meetings that occurred since the last city council meeting, or rather the last, since the last update. So um, if there are any council members who would like to start um, with updates, 
Council Member Golder. Um, hi. So I have an update from the Countywide Integrated Waste Management Task Force. I attended on the 3rd, and we discussed in one of the things we discussed was the fire cleanup, and a lot of the cleanup was going to the Buena Vista landfill, landfill at that time, and they were also collecting waste um, from the evacuation centers and taking it there. And they were also taking it to um, centers in neighboring counties, and um, they wanted to um, let the public know that working, they're working with environmental health to ensure that the sites are not hazardous and that the lots are ready to build before letting people rebuild on them. And then one thing I thought was interesting was that um, when talking about ash cleanup, because there is a lot of ash debris within the city, is that it can also be toxic. And so it's best to sweep it up if possible and not down the storm drain because um, it, you know, if you can sweep it up, that's one thing. Or another thing is put it, push it into landscape and let it just kind of um, break down naturally there. And um, like Rosemary said, the water is safe within the city, but residents in some parts of our county are being advised not to currently drink their water until it's safe. And we also discussed um, food waste projects that are coming up and, and um, plastic bag bands and um, to-go food container things that are going to be postponed for now, but updated later. And that's it. Okay. Thanks. It looks like we have Republic Works Director Mark Bettle. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. I just wanted to add something um, to Councilmember Golder's statement, and that's correct to sweep it up. But if you can put it in a plastic bag and seal that bag and, and put it in your trash so that just don't dump it into your, your refuse can, because then when we dump it, it'll, it goes back in the air again. So we really want to try to contain that. So if people are going to, you can kind of wet it down and sweep it. It can easily be swept up and then put it in a plastic bag and seal that up. That would be great. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Vice Mayor Myers. It looks like you're muted also. Uh, just a quick update. We did have our city schools committee meeting last month. Um, and this was um, a meeting just prior to the announcement by the governor that uh, schools would not be going back in session. Um, there continues to be the need for um, additional technologies that um, for serving our our kids, um, and also uh, locations for distance learning. Uh, so you know, thinking through places where potentially families and um, students and teachers could meet with regards to either teaching outside um, or as it gets colder, uh, figuring out some additional. Um, uh, some additional um, possibilities for people to gather for some in-person learning. Of course, that's all going to be changing. So most of those um, most of those items have have morphed back into um, really having schools working out of homes right now. But uh, uh, the other thing with city schools um, was just um, really they're doing a our, our parks and rec department is doing a great job working with them on um, all kinds of different things in terms of access to various facilities and, you know, all the way to childcare and some other things. So just a really good partnership there. Uh, the homeless two by two committee um, due to the fires did not meet this month. Um, and I believe we are trying to get rescheduled on that. And um, we had a long Metro, uh, Metro meeting last week um, at, or towards the end of the month. And um, just extensive work uh, right now trying to uh, look at routes moving ahead, continue to have um, not a lot of, um, you know, smaller amounts of people on the buses um, and really trying to figure out uh, sort of the business plan moving forward. Uh, we've had obviously a, a major ridership reduction. Uh, we have received and are uh, currently using uh, the recovery funds that were provided to transit districts throughout the country. But uh, Metro will have to be doing quite a lot of business planning and financial planning moving ahead. Um, a lot, we got an extensive report from our, from the um, executive officer regarding all the safety measures put in uh, on the buses, uh, including uh, state-of-the-art um, methods to try to keep 
keep people safe uh, with on the buses uh, during their travels and also looking at technologies uh, with regards to not having to use money or cards or anything like that moving forward. So smartphone, smartphone technology and things like that. So um, very interesting update. We were on hiatus obviously in July and uh, learned a lot in terms of all the work of the of the metro over the last two months uh, at last month's uh, board meeting and that's all thank you mayor thank you are there any other council members who have updates councilmember matthews you're also muted here um, in terms of visit santa cruz county um, we heard about uh, the um, ongoing messaging of the Santa Cruz County from um, <clears throat> don't come <laughs> to uh, um, public safety uh, messaging. Uh, they've tried to be very responsive, put a, a travel advisory right on the front of their um, website, um, basically saying, come later <laughs> when it's safe and and trying to really be good partners with um, all the emergency services the, the um, spring campaign uh, obviously their budget has undergone a lot of um, um, things put on hold and restructuring um, they have in response to some um, diminished resources um, uh, laid off some staff reorganized their staff a bit there's down from 11 and a half FTEs to seven, and they're they're rolling with the punches. Um, seeing the um, campaign when it does tear up in the future will be the, the theme for this text, Santa Cruz County, let's cruise. The theme can be let's cruise safely, um, just for visitors and for staff in every respect. The emphasis is on safety, so they really are trying to reinforce that message. Um, they've been putting up, um, as I think you know, a lot of evacuees, um, many of the properties giving uh, special rates. Um, they are also currently housing uh, PG&E crews, um, emergency crews that have come in. So um, it's been uh, quite a mixed bag of um, who they're serving at present. Um, another thing that's kind of of interest, um, some of you may know the Visit Santa Cruz County for its revenue depends largely on a tourism marketing district. It's a self-assessment program. Uh, that, that's been in place for um, at least 10 years. And it's due to come up for, um, the current one expires in 2022. So uh, they're just now beginning the process to examine the current assessment rate, who sits on the board, et cetera. So um, to do a good job of this and hit the timeline, it does take a couple of years to do the work, do the outreach to all the properties. There are over 100 properties in Santa Cruz County. So um, this is really kind of insider baseball <laughs> in a way, but it does need um, the majority of the properties to come on and agree and feel comfortable with it. It's, it's worked well for them so far. So they have, um, they're in the process of appointing the task force to guide that TMD renewal process. Um, and ultimately that does have to be approved by the city council when the, by all the jurisdictions. Um, so uh, that will come to the council at some point in the mid future. Um, I think that's the bulk of it. Um, yeah, that, that covers the bulk of it. Um, basically, they're they're doing some major organizational changes, uh, trying to stay on message for what serves the community needs and um, keep their properties alive, and eventually um, supporting the city once again <laughs> with you <laughs> when the time is right. Great, thanks. Councilmember Brown. Uh, yeah, so today really would be the day to give 
comprehensive report <laughs> from the commissions and boards um, since we have a light agenda, but um, I don't have a lot. Uh, uh, I will say that the Regional Transportation Commission meeting, uh, we approved a five-year plan for Measure D expenditures. Um, and I guess the highlight from that would be uh, that the revenue projections uh, that we have been looking at, and everything's super fluid, obviously, um, but the projections actually, um, the actuals were not down as far as we had anticipated. So um, that is going to be a big help uh, for the it, to not have to make cuts into some of the programming that has already been scheduled. Um, there may be some kind of slowdown with sequencing and timing, but um, overall uh, we're managing to stay pretty well on track. Uh, and I think in the budget committee's meeting, you'll hear more from us uh, at our next meeting on that. Councilmember Matthews. Uh, looking over this list, um, I think, I don't know if this is something in the budget process to look at. There's some committees that are kind of designated. They don't even have representatives or staffing. I don't know if this is an occasion with taking a hard look at all our work programs and our available energy um, if we want to re-examine um, whether those are still priorities. <laughs> so that's, that's just an observation. I'm pleased to say that the Code of Conduct Committee has done its work, and so you can take us off this list <laughs> in the future. I don't know about the Downtown Library Subcommittee. If you consider your work done there, you're going to keep that um, available on hold. But, you know, I think just look at the list, see what makes sense in the current time that we're in. Yeah, that's a good point. I think that um, that might be something worth considering when these items come forward. And so as it relates to the um, the code of conduct, maybe that's a part of them. When we get to that item, we can talk about that in a little bit further detail today. Um, the other council members? I, um, I just have a really brief update. I think the um, other committees I'm on were covered already. Uh, but just in regards to the farmer's market, they have been in touch with our economic development department to do some lobbying around trying to get um, more uh, family spending power and food dollars like the pediatric EDP uh, cards that were issued to support families. And so how are we, in terms of our communications with the state, advocating for more of those types of programs so that we're able to continue to serve uh, those who are in need of fresh produce? And then... Um, and then just also, not necessarily affecting the city directly, but they uh, were uh, displaced from their regular Scotts Valley location because of the staging that occurred for uh, combating the fires. And so they have a new location in Scotts Valley uh, that is, uh, let's see, it's in, the, it's in the, uh, the Scotts Valley Square Shopping Center and it's on Saturday. So that's gonna be a new location that they were able to find up there. So that's probably it for me. Great, thanks. Um, just as an announcement, the, um, the rental data committee didn't meet last month, but we'll be meeting on September 10th. Um, and then for council members who are interested, and I know members of the public have been interested, I think that the next report on the library is supposed to be coming at our next meeting um, in September. So just so in case people are interested in when that report is coming back. and it, Expectation is that the conversations around um, contractors and will have a sense of, of who has applied through the city and kind of next steps based on that, or, or the development manager, I should say, if that's the appropriate term. Um, so we should be getting an update at the next council meeting as it relates to the library. Um, as for LAFCO, the commission approved the, de the termination of inactive proposals in accordance with the commission's adopted policies. And these are generally um, applications that, were, that have been inactive for over a year. And so that includes the City of Santa Cruz um, sphere of influence amendment to include there have been no action on that application since December of 2011. From the city of Santa Cruz, there have been no action on that application since plain 
extraterritorial water service. Um, there have been no action or discussion on that item since March of 2016. Uh, we had not received any uh, letters from any of those entities. And so those applications were based on previous conversations. There will be actions taking place as it relates to the city providing water to Upper Camp. He wasn't able to dial in, and I just tried, okay. and it didn't work. So I'm wondering if I should stop the meeting and restart it and have everyone else join in again. Okay. Um, yeah, so why don't we try to see if we can fix this technical difficulty by having everyone um, – we're going to – Stop the meeting, and if you can all call in again, and we'll try to get our meeting restarted again here in about two to three minutes. I have a question. Oh, council member. Yeah. So does that mean if we, the council members, have called in by phone and we're on the meeting, that we should also hang up and call in again? I or think that, yeah. Yeah, yeah mm -hmm. I think we should all do that. Okay. All right. See everyone. Okay, if council members could could uh, turn the videos back on, we can go ahead and get started. It doesn't look like, oh, there we go. Okay, so the next item on our agenda is our consent agenda. These are items numbers 12 through 23 on our agenda. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, now is the time to call in if you'd like to comment on item numbers 12 through 23. The instructions to call in should be on your screen. Please remember to mute your streaming device and press star nine to raise your hand and listen for the cue saying that you've been unmuted. All items will be acted upon in one motion unless an item is pulled by council members for further discussion. Are there any council members that would like to pull any items I'm going to pull item number 16. Are there any council members who wish to just comment on any items on our consent agenda? Council Member Watkins. Thank you. I'd like to comment just on, on item 14 briefly. Okay. Are there any other comments, Vice Mayor Myers? Uh, just a comment, quick comment on 13 and a quick comment on 18. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Are there any other council members with comments on items that are on our agenda? Hey, Bonnie, I just realized too, is it possible for you to make me a uh, host for the meeting? And then I also have a comment on item number 13 as well. Okay. Um, if there are any members of the public who would like to comment on our consent agenda items with the exception of item number 16, now is the time to call in. Once you've called into the meeting, please press star 9 on your phone to raise your hand. Uh, once you've been acknowledged, you'll be asked to unmute, and you will be given two minutes to comment on the consent, the consent agenda. I'm so again, wondering if we want to reopen it also maybe again, um, just because we didn't really give people a lot of time to call in. But sure. Up, yeah. yeah, so if there's any members of the public uh, who would like to speak to us, on our consent agenda. Um, these are items numbers 12 through 23 that are being heard at this time. Um, item number 16 has been pulled from the consent agenda. And if there are any members of the public who would like to, um, to speak to any of the items on our consent agenda with the exception of item number 16, now is the time to call in. Once you've called in, you'll wanna press star nine on your phone to raise your hand you'll be given two minutes to speak. While we're providing an opportunity for um, members of the public to call in, why don't we circle back to those council members who had comments. Uh, we can start with um, Council Member Watkins. Uh, 
Um, I just wanted to just make a brief comment on item number 14. I want to thank the mayor and vice mayor for co-signing this item. I think it's really um, one way local jurisdictions can do our part to uh, acknowledge past practices that have led to um, racism influencing a health outcomes. And this is a, a step in the right direction through this acknowledgement, and I'm grateful to be able to co-sign and bring this forward as a city of Santa Cruz. Yeah, thank you as well for bringing this to our attention. And um, also, I know a number of members of the public reached out to us regarding this, especially since the county has also made a similar declaration. So thank you again for, for asking us to sign on to this with you. Yes, thank you. Uh, Vice Mayor Myers. Yeah, I just wanted to um, thank the mayor and um, our staff um, in the city manager's office for putting together the grand jury responses. Um, I don't have any specific comments or questions. Um, I just wanted to recognize the work done to date. And two of the reports really stood out to me, one um, being the De La Viega golf course report. Um, and I think what really stands out in that report is that um, you know, when we don't take care of our city assets, when we're not able to actually put the funding into maintaining buildings and um, upgrading things and sort of deferring the kinds of really the care that is necessary in a climate like, like ours, um, you know, our assets start to fall apart. And, um, you know, I think it's important as we go through another budget crisis that, you um, we continue to let our community know that many of the buildings the city owns are older. Um, many of them are, you know, on a list of long list of deferred maintenance activities. So I think this report um, points out um, both the struggle as a local agency to try to maintain all of our different assets that we do have, but also the importance to do that work uh, to the extent possible along the way. And. Um, I do think that the um, golf course, I'm excited about some of the um, vision that our parks director has with regards to the golf course, not only for golfing, but also for Frisbee golf um, and some of the other things that are ahead. So um, I think it's a, it's a good snapshot on, um, you know, an important facility similar to our swimming pool, similar to a lot of these places that are very expensive to keep up, but they become more expensive when they're when they're sort of at the end of life rather than um, along the way. So um, I appreciate the ability to just have that kind of daylighted um, via this process. And then I just wanted to also compliment, even though we were part of the uh, uh, communities listed in the regarding the um, kind of best practices around budgeting and around risk management, um, I do believe that our decisions and of past decisions of councils before us. Um, have really placed us, especially with regards to the PERS obligation, in a, in a pretty solid place. And um, despite the emergency we're in now, at no fault of our own, um, we were keeping a pace and doing those best practices. So I just want to recognize our staff for um, really um, trying to manage that risk, trying to manage those obligations moving ahead for our community and for our city. So thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Vice Mayor Myers, I know you had comments on number 18 as well. Did you want to make those comments? That was just a very quick thank you um, to um, Commissioner Hamilton. Um, she's going off of yeah. our downtown uh, downtown commission. Um, just a really involved person, um, always helpful in really understanding and think for thinking improvements in our downtown and. Um, just uh, has been a longtime advisor in, in a commissioner role, and I just wanted to appreciate her service. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Watkins, I saw your hand was raised again. I just wanted to acknowledge you. Yeah, thank you. I just had, I forgot to mention earlier, I just had a brief comment on item number 20, um, and that is the, uh, the completion of the uh, Safe Routes to School Crossing Program, and I know um, we all benefit from that, and I've seen the improvements go up in our neighborhoods and our kids and our community can uh, get to school and uh, go about the community in a much safer way as a result of that. And it's just a really testament to our, um, our public works and active transportation folks who are working on grants and getting the funding in and doing some pass through for education to the nonprofits. And I um, just wanted to acknowledge their work and uh, appreciation for making our streets safer for our kids. So thanks. 
I forgot to mention it earlier. Thank you for that comment. Um, I just had a oh, I just had a quick comment on um, item number thirteen, just because I know that there are some that there are two reports that are, are not included there, and I just wanted to let folks know that um, we re we received uh, feedback from council members on the fourth, and given that we wanted to ensure that we had adequate time to um, incorporate that feedback into the um, the recommendations on the grand jury. These reports aren't due until um, after our next council meeting, and so we wanted to ensure that there's adequate time to provide that feedback and incorporate that into our, our answers. So those two reports, um, the one on um, council relationships and homelessness, those two reports will be coming back at the next council meeting in September. So just wanted to make sure folks were aware. Um, so if there are no further questions or comments on uh, items on our consent, with the exception of item number 16, uh, we'll open it up to public comment. So if you'd like, if members of the public would like to comment on items on our consent agenda with the exception of item number 16, please uh, call the numbers that are on your screen. Once you've called in, please press, please press star 9 on your phone to raise your hand and you will be given two minutes. Yes, this is Garrett Phillip. Um, on item 14, um, saying racism is a public health crisis does not make it so, but so-called protesting racism accompanied by violent rooting, looting, rioting, arson, murder, vandalism, assaulting the public and police, police protection defunding, destroying of businesses, and anarchists chanting death to America, as they have in the leftist home office in Oakland, is very much more so a public health crisis and a crisis of politic. Where is the declaration of that crisis? No really where is it? This knee-jerk leftist progressive politic crisis declaration suffers as overblown, unjustified, and inflammatory. There are many causes of life outcomes, including shortcomings in ethnic culture, but primary responsibility for each life rests with the individual, not the state. There is plenty of opportunity in America, and rags to riches as possible in one generation. Equal opportunity has existed for at least two generations, regardless of anecdotal evidence of declining examples of racism or not. A two-term black president, a black mayor, and otherwise all women council should be proof enough opportunity exists like never before. Crisis is a, it is not. This is a dangerous pandering endorsement of the disingenuous Marxist anarchist mob hidden agenda, which is a destabilizing threat to America. The riots in 48 of the 50 largest cities in America since March are a manifestation of evil. Intended or not, it's an endorsement of that evil. While I haven't examined your actual plans as hinted at to uh, force your racial indoctrination theories onto city employees, I would warn against pushing the vile critical race theories, or simply put, the white man bad theories, which are devoid of any justified rational purpose except hate, or now, as we see, it can be a promotion of the Marxist anarchy movement also. You should know Trump has issued an executive order banning such instruction of critical race theory at federal institutions, agencies, contractors, and urge the OMB to defund any that does. If such appears in any city employee training, I urge the employees to collect the materials or report the city to the president so that the city may have any federal grant money defunded or desist. There has never been a lower ratio of actual racism to the violent hotter blown about it than there is today. Okay, I see my time is up. Bye. Thank you. If there's any other member of the public who'd like to speak to us on items on our consent agenda with the exception of item number 16, Please press, press star nine on your phone to raise your hand and you will have two minutes. Okay, seeing that there's no other member of the public who'd like to speak to items that are on our consent agenda with the exception of item number 16. I'll bring it back to council, um, look for a motion to um, move the, the remaining consent agenda items. Council Member Watkins. I'll move the consent agenda with the exception of item 16. Okay. Uh, Vice Mayor Myers. Oh, you're, you're muted. I'll second that. Okay, so we have a motion 
by Councilmember Watkins, seconded by Vice Mayor Myers to move the consent agenda with the exception of item number 16. I'd like to call on the clerk to please call the roll vote. Thank you, Mayor. Councilmember Byers? Aye. Matthews? Aye. Brown? Aye. Golder? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Vice Mayor Myers? Aye. And Mayor Cummings? Aye. That passes unanimously. Uh, we'll move on to item number 16. I, I pulled this item just because uh, there was just one a, a line in, in the, the, um, the policy that I just wanted to follow up on. And I'd like to actually thank um, the people who volunteered to be on this committee for their work to bring this forward. I think it's really going to help streamline you know, instances when there may be dif disagreements or conflict between council members moving forward. And I think it'll be really helpful uh, for us to be able to you know, have a process where we can you know, address um, complaints and comments in a meaningful way. Um, so, so the one question I had, it's on um, page number four. Um, I know that it seems like often there's a way if there's complaints um, by council members and if it includes the mayor, it would go to the vice mayor. Uh, this is in the lines in D1. And I just um, wanted to see if maybe a line could be added in because I just wonder if there's ever an event where there's conflict between the mayor and the vice mayor where one makes a complaint versus the other. Currently, the way that it's stated is if a complaint's made by a council member against the mayor, it would go to the vice mayor, but there's nothing in case there's a conflict between, if there's a, uh, if there's a complaint made on the mayor makes one against the vice mayor, the vice mayor makes a complaint against the mayor. So I'm wondering if there can be, you know, whether it's the senior member of the council or if it's someone in the city manager's office, but I think that there needs to be something in there um, in case there's a complaint and conflict between the mayor and vice mayor. Mayor Cummings, Lisa Murphy, your human resources director. I, I see what you're talking about in terms of um, how, how to mitigate between that two. And I think to keep it with the within the same, with the council, we would need to probably go at a line about the next most senior um, member. I think we could okay. easily just drop a line in like that. Okay. And I guess the other question I had too is when it's the next senior member, if that is just, if like defining that, whether that's years on council or, because I just think about if someone has served, you know, and they take a break for 10 years and then they decide to serve again um, and someone's, you know, more recently served, like which, like how we would define, you know, that seniority. I think uh, that's a good question. And I think what you should probably consider doing is to have it be uh, consecutive years on the council be the first one. Uh, and then the second tier would be something along the lines of uh, most votes, if that was the conflict in between there. I think something similar that you do is when you select mayor or vice mayor. Okay. If that's acceptable, I can add that in. I guess I guess we can. I'm, that's fine. That's fine by me. Um, I think that if we can add that to the motion, it would just be helpful. You know, that if there's a conflict between the mayor and vice mayor, that the next senior member is um, to report it to the next senior member of council, and then seniority is based on consecutive years of service or most votes in the previous election. Mm -hmm. And we can, we definitely can put that definition at it as another bullet. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Matthews and Council Member Golder. I, at some point, just want to ask Lisa to read us the language that we're going in. This is, this is fine. It's a, it's a 
probably pull it up on the screen uh, to share my screen and actually edit it on screen, if that would be helpful. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Mayor Cummins, just a thumbs up if you can see that. Great. Okay. Uh, so this would be the... Uh, oh, of course, I'm in PDF. I apologize. I'm in PDF. So I'm not in Word. Um, so I think, though, in the uh, in the first section where it was the line item two, uh, upon report of a complaint, an ad hoc committee composed of the mayor, vice mayor, and the most senior uninvolved council member will convene as an evaluation committee to determine the validity of the complaint and, if appropriate, an initial course of action. I think in the section here where it talks about upon report of a complaint of ad hoc composed of mayor, vice mayor, and the most senior uninvolved council member. So that by default, then Mayor Cummings, if the mayor or the vice mayor, if either one of them or both were um, uh, involved, both of them would not be entitled to sit on the subcommittee. And we would then, um, I think by default, that refers to the fact that they couldn't, because they are involved, and then we'd have to pull up the next senior members. So we could actually leave it as is, if that you think that might address it, or I could continue to try to clarify. I think uh, that might, I was, I was actually looking at the, um, the, in B1, if this does not resolve the matter, or if there's sufficient complexity or legal violation, then it shall be reported directly to the mayor in the event that the mayor is the subject of the inquiry, the role of that official shall be the vice mayor. And then I was just thinking another sentence, in the event that both the mayor and the vice mayor are the subject of inquiry, the ro role of that official shall be the most senior um, okay. uninvolved council member. I think you captured it perfect. And then I guess there might be a good place to, to, to define um, most senior council member is defined as uh, the council member with the most consecutive years of service. And in the event that there's a tie, the one who received the most votes in the previous election. Yes, I think that's a perfect place to drop it in there under under one. It could be something in the nature of, you know, 1A. Okay. Council Member Matthews, does that sound, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm it's unable fine. to type it's that. Fine. Okay. <laughs> I didn't realize I was in a PDF. <laughs> My own impression is this is trying to put into words how to make a dysfunctional family love each other. <laughs> Yeah, I think, you know, we can only go so far into the details. Okay. Um, Vice Mayor Myers. Um, I just uh, I just wanted to thank the committee for doing the work. Um, I'm glad to see this coming forward. Uh, I want to thank Lisa for her work as well. Um, it's just really important that we have a process where people can can work through, um, you know, various issues. And uh, just uh, want to thank the committee and for the new uh, Catherine and for Renee for joining the committee towards the end and uh, basically getting over the finish line. So thank you. Thanks to everybody. Hey. Councilmember Matthews. Oh, when the time comes, I'll be prepared to make a motion, but I think you have to open it to the public first. Yep. Yeah. So I'll open it up to the public. So if there are members of the public who would like to speak to item number 15, or number 16, apologies, um, that was on our consent agenda, now is the time to call in. Once you've called into the meeting, please press star 9 on your phone to raise your hand, and you will be given two minutes to speak to us on this item. So could I make a comment uh, in the meantime, sure. Mayor Cummings? Uh, I think at, at the risk of further complicating the discussion, um, item B2, upon report of a complaint, 
a committee composed of the mayor, the vice mayor, and the most uninvolved council member, et cetera, et cetera. But if the subject of the complaint involves the mayor and vice mayor, an committee established a, the council member with the most consecutive yeah. years of, et cetera. Um, you you cut out multiple times. I didn't hear any of what you said. Uh, but if, if, if the city clerk captured it, I'm that that that's perfect. No, he cut out for me too. Oh, sorry. I was saying that if we modify subsection B1 to specify that when the subject of the inquiry involves both the mayor and the vice mayor, then the matter shall be reported to the council member with the most consecutive years of service or if there are more than one council member uh, with most consecutive years of service, then the council member who received the highest number of votes at, that, at their election. And then subparagraph two uh, should be revised to specify that if the subject of the inquiry involves both the mayor and vice mayor, then an ad hoc committee will be convened uh, by the council member with the most consecutive years of service, et cetera. Does that make sense? Yeah. 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 Okay, so if there are any members of the public, if you'd like to speak to item number 16 on our consent agenda, now is the time to call in. Once you've called in, please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand and you'll be given two minutes. Members of the public who'd like to speak to us on this item, I'll bring it back to council for action and deliberation. Councilmember Matthews. I will uh, go ahead and move adoption of the code of ed officials as amended during this discussion. Um, and uh, appreciation to the council members and staff who participated in this. And then I'd like to make a couple comments. Um, so motion by Councilmember Matthews, Councilmember Brown. Yeah, I'll, I'll second that uh, with thanks to the council members who participated in the process and, and staff as well. Okay, so we have a motion by Councilmember Matthews, seconded by Councilmember Brown to move item number 16 with the additional amended language. Um, Councilmember Matthews, you had some comments. Yeah, um, I do want to point out that there were actually a total of five council members who participated in this over time, and in all the meetings, there were um, really thoughtful comments made. And um, I, I do want to thank Lisa for rolling with the punches and keeping us on track. This, um, the absence of such a policy and the um, value of having it on record um, became evident to us um, in recent history. And this kind of code of ethics and conduct policy is pretty common in municipalities. Uh, the one that we presented here is based on a template um, with variations and updates appropriate to, to our community, but uh, this reflects what many, 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 many other uh, cities in California and the country are doing. So we are not inventing the wheel here, but it seems to reflect a general feeling of what's the most productive way to um, conduct ourselves both with among ourselves and our staff and the general public. Um, so aside from that, I think the other thing that was pointed out to us is important is to make sure that um, new council members and commissioners are um, informed of this early, early on, <laughs> just so we kind of know the assumptions going into this. And uh, hopefully it needs to be um, used rarely. Councilmember Matthews, it also sounds like there's a little bit of um, 
trouble hearing you, so when you're speaking oh. into the mic, you can lean a little bit closer. I can, we can hear you fine. I think it's on the, uh, the end of um, picking you up on the, um, in chambers. Huh, because I did dial in as instructed. So anyway. I think you just need to speak louder. Okay. Do you need me to repeat? Basically, this was based on the will use template. <laughs> the importance is early training for all concerned. Thank you. Um, I just have, a, before we move on to the vote, I was just going to ask um, that maybe a friend, as a friendly amendment or just as a recommendation that um, the finalized policy be sent to all commissioners, council members, um, so that everybody has a copy of this updated um, policy and that, you know, if there's a, if they need to sign stating that they've read the policy that um, we make that as a part of this as well so that there's no confusion. I am happy to incorporate that as direction, follow-up direction to the adoption that the, the newly adopted uh, Code of Ethics and Policy be distributed to well, we all have it, but uh, to um, commissioners, and um, that a standard part of orientation is the signed recognition that it's been received and read. Great. Uh, if there's no further questions or comments, I'd like to uh, ask the clerk to please call the roll vote on this item. <clears throat> Thank you, Mayor. Council Members Byers? Aye. Matthews? Aye. Brown? Aye. Golder? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Vice Mayor Myers? Aye. And Mayor Cummings? Aye. That item passes unanimously. Okay, next on our agenda is our consent public hearing. This is item number 24. Uh, I'd also like to let members of the public know that if you're calling in about item number 25, which is uh, Parks Master Plan, that item has been deleted uh, from our agenda. And so just wanted to reaffirm and let folks know that if you're calling in about the Parks Master Plan item, that item will not be heard today. Um, so our uh, consent public hearing item, for members of the public who are streaming, if this is an item you would like to comment on, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. Are there any uh, members of the or city council members who would like to pull item number 24 from the agenda? Okay, seeing none, are there any comment, are there any council members who would only wish to comment on item number 24 on our agenda? Okay, seeing none, if there are any members of the public who would like to speak to item on our consent, item number 24 on our consent agenda, now is the time to do so. Please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. When it's your time to speak, you'll hear an announcement that you've been unmuted and the timer will be set to two minutes. of the public who'd like to speak to us on this item, I'd like to bring it back to council for action and deliberation. Uh, council Member Matthews. I'll go ahead and move the recommendation. Okay. Uh, council Member, or Vice Mayor Myers. Oh, you're muted. I'll second. Okay, so we have a motion, Council Member Matthews, to move the um, Consent public hearing items seconded by Vice Mayor Myers. Is there any further questions or comments from council members? Seeing none, I'll turn it over to the clerk to call the roll vote. Councilmember Byers? Aye. Matthews? Aye. Brown? Aye. Golder? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Vice Mayor Myers? Aye. And Mayor Cummings. Aye. That passes unanimously. Um, we're going to make it pretty quickly through our agenda since we have deleted item number 25 from our agenda. We are 
on the last item on our agenda prior to oral communications. Um, this is item number 26. I'm imposing a prohibition on price gouging in the city of Santa Cruz following the CZU August Lightning complex fire. Uh, for members of the public who are streaming this meeting, if this is an item you want to comment on, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. The order will be a presentation of the item by the council member who brought this forward, followed by questions from council. We will then take public comment and return to the council for deliberation and action. Um, I'm not sure, Tony, if you'd like to speak to this first or if I could kick us off on this item. Um, I, what, whatever is the pleasure of, of the mayor, um, I'm, I'm happy to introduce it or, or if you'd like to, that's, that's totally fine. Sure, I can, I can go ahead and just give some context for this item. So um, as everyone's aware of the impacts of the CZU fire complex, uh, many residents throughout the county were evacuated from their homes. Um, as a response to the fire. And as we're all aware, there's been um, hundreds, if not close to 1,000 homes lost throughout the county. Um, we've had many residents who have been displaced and are um, staying in hotels. Um, folks who've lost their homes have now began looking for rentals. I um, mean, we do understand that the negative impacts on the infrastructure within these areas can make it very difficult and for people to return to their homes and um, the time frame for them to return is probably going to be um, pretty, you know, long-term impacts. I had um, received emails. I'd received an email in particular where someone had reported that they were having a difficult circumstance with um, one of the hotels that they were, were trying to rent. And I do want to express my uh, profound and sincere uh, thanks to all the people in our community who have done such a good job of opening their homes uh, with all with the many hoteliers who have you know been really trying to help evacuees and for our, our community for really the generosity that's been outpouring from our from everyone to try to support the victims of this fire um, but what really um, prompted bringing this in addition to that person who reached out was heard you know hearing of a couple other instances where um, evacuees were being impacted and potentially uh, displaced from their hotels when they had nowhere else to go. And um, thinking in thinking about pr communities who have been previously impacted after the Paradise Fire, the Santa Rosa fires, where they really started seeing rents going rents increasing um, in terms of people who were trying to find rentals as a result of an increase in demand. Um, just really wanting to try to get in front of this before it became a problem. And with many people being concerned with that, uh, I thought that it would be something good to bring forward to the council for discussion and, and action. Um, in addition to this, I'll mention that I did speak to um, um, some of the county supervisors, and I know council or county supervisor Coonerty mentioned to me that an item would be going on the county's agenda um, for their September 14th meeting. And so the idea is that you know we could discuss putting this, you know, we could discuss this today, adopting um, an emergency prohibition on price gouging, um, and you know. Should the count the county adopt something similar, we could align ours um, potentially with the county in the future. But um, before we go into further discussion, I'd like to also turn it over to the um, city attorney for um, further information. And I'd also like to say similarly, this was not um, something that um, kind of came out of nowhere. It's a lot of it's based off of other cities that have imposed similar ordinances. And so with that. I'll turn it over to the city attorney to provide further background on this item. Yes, thank you, Mayor Cummings and members of the city council. First of all, I'd like to just go through the categories of uh, different categories of what's defined by the state law as price gouging um, to list uh, what is prohibited by this. So it, it makes it unlawful to uh, sell consumer food items or goods uh, or services used for emergency cleanup, emergency supplies, medical supplies, home heating oil, building materials, transportation, freight and storage service, or gasoline or motor, motor fuels by more than 10% of the advertised price prior to the declaration of the emergency. The second category is repair or reconstruction services or services used in emergency cleanup. Um, the third category is uh, 
uh, makes it unlawful for the operator of a hotel or motel um, or other transient occupancy like a short-term rental to increase uh, their prices by 10% more than the advertised price immediately prior to the proclamation of an emergency. And the fourth category is um, a prohibition on eviction of any residential tenant uh, or, or tenant of residential housing for the purpose of renting to another person at a rental price that's uh, greater than the evicted tenant uh, could be charged uh, or what was being charged prior to the proclamation of an emergency. Um, you may have questions about why this is being brought forward if it's already covered by state law. That's a question that I received over the weekend. And, um, and the reason why is that under the state law, this automatically kicks in on the proclamation of an emergency by the governor or um, by the city council, uh, but it is only in effect for 30 days, except for the um, uh, it's only in effect for 30 days, um, and then it expires automatically under the state law. So what this does is give you gives the council an opportunity to extend that prohibition beyond 30 days. Uh, and so that's the reason why action is necessary. Otherwise, the price, price gouging prohibition would expire on its own. Um, the second thing I wanted to point out is that um, this has been brought forward by way of an ordinance, an emergency ordinance, uh, that the council can opt it, uh, adopt on a, on a five a vote majority. Um, however, under the charter, when you adopt an emergency ordinance, it has to be published within 15 days of adoption in, in order for it to remain in effect. It takes effect immediately, but it has to be published uh, subsequent to that within 15 days. And the city clerk pointed out to me last week that under our charter, um, when we do that publication, it costs the city about $1,500. And so, um, so that's an, that's a fiscal impact that that the city has, and the city has a budget for uh, publications in connection with city council meetings. But the statute all, also requires that the declaration be extended by successive 30-day periods in order to remain in effect. So the council will need to take action every 30 days as long as it uh, sees the need to have these restrictions in effect. And what the city clerk pointed out to me was that that would essentially um, use up the city council's entire budget for publication of ordinances uh, within a couple of. And so what I'm looking into between now and the next meeting is whether or not this could be extended by a simple resolution, which would not require, require publication. And so that would just be to avoid the fiscal impact of having to um, continually publish the same uh, prohibitions that would, that would remain in effect. Assuming that to be the case, then we would come back to the council on the 22nd of September, um, because otherwise the first meeting in October, which is the 13th, is more than 30 days from today. So um, it would expire before your next, um, before the first October meeting. And so assuming that a resolution is an appropriate way to go forward, I would expect this to be on the consent calendar for the next couple of months until the council directs that it be lifted. Um, happy to answer any questions that council members have. Tony, I had one follow-up question to that. So would it be that if we made the declaration today, that would be followed by a resolution at the next meeting, should we want to extend it? That's, that's what I'm hoping, yes. Okay. Uh, council Member Watkins. Um, thank you for the for the um, summary of it, and I um, I know having kind of just tracked the news that this does happen in certain communities, and so we do want to be ahead of it. Um, Mayor, I think if I heard you correctly, you mentioned that you were in communication with the county about this. I, I mean, I'd, I'd be interested in, in understanding a little bit more about what direction they're headed in as well. So I shared with them the language of this ordinance, and they. Um, we're gonna bring something similar forward. And Tony, I don't know if their offices reached out to you, but I'd heard that they might be reaching out to you as well. Uh, they have not at this point, but I can certainly reach out to the county council and, and 
uh, get their input. Um, I have I have one other question in terms of the, the procedure. Um, if I sorry, I'm trying to take all what you said in Tony. Um, in terms of procedurally, it sounds like the emergency is the added cost associated with this policy direction. But if, if, for, if for cost savings and for alignment with county, if it were brought back as a regular sort of ordinance, what does that look like in terms of, of changes? Nothing different other than the cost? Or? Um, there's still a publication requirement for an ordinance that's brought forward in the ordinary course. The concern I have about that is that the, the penal code, which provides you with the authorization to take this action, uh, states that the prohibitions may be extended for additional 30-day periods as needed by a local legislative body, a uh, local official, the governor, uh, or the legislature. So um, it does not allow this type of regulation to remain in effect in perpetuity, which is a, generally what happens when you adopt a new ordinance. And so um, I suppose what we could do is, um, in fact, I'm thinking of it right now, is um, modify this to say, uh, or for additional periods as uh, determined by resolution of the city council. So that would be language that I would add to the um, effective date and the expiration date of the ordinance. Okay. I just have I have one last question. In terms of the findings, um, the, the the declaration is the finding that we've declared a, an emergency associated with a fire to, to to move in this direction. Is that accurate? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. I think that's it for right now. Councilmember Matthews. Um, am I correct in understanding that the state um, anti gouging um, provisions are in effect for 30 days? Yes, except for the, and I, this is the one I was uh, searching for in my presentation, but the uh, prohibition on price gouging in um, repair services. Um, is for 180 days. Oh, even more. Right. Oh, well, my own preference would be to continue this to our next meeting um, and have more of a conversation with the county in terms of syncing up with um, their language and their findings of urgency. Um, and um, it was also, I, I also spoke with someone at the county. They pointed out to me the fee for a violation is much lower in our proposed ordinance than it is in the state. So there's probably just some um, consistency issues that should be resolved ahead of time. I also had some, um, um, I just thought it would be worth raising the issue that particularly for hotels and motels, their rates are, as I think everyone understands, very fluid according to season and day of the week and weather, <laughs> all sorts of other things. Um, and particularly immediately before the fire, that industry was in total free fall with zero occupancy, so their rates were probably, you know, half. I, I look at their average daily rates and immediately, uh, the, the few months, most recent months, their average rate for the season were about half of what they were in the normal year. So 10% um, up from that would be artificially low because they were in an extreme recession. You see where I'm going with that. And I'm not trying to plead for a blank check, but I'm just saying in that case, it seems like an extraordinary circumstance. So that probably just takes a little bit of examination. Um, so for all those reasons, um, largely just consistency with the um, with what the county is doing and the idea of doing it by resolution, which is um, easier to continue. Um, my preference would be just to continue to the next meeting. And then I would just ask um, Mayor what you did envision as the duration of this, because rebuilding, I mean, that's going to be going on for a while. That's not a 30-day or 60-day. 
thing. So I am just, that's just an honest question that we saw in the solution of that. Yeah, I'll let uh, other council members ask questions, and I'll come. I'll circle back to that one. Councilman Matthews, uh, Vice Mayor Myers. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Um, I just have a question, Tony, maybe for you. So, um, so the state law is um, is it AB three ninety six? That is the emergency price gouging ordinance, correct? Yes, the uh, provision of the penal code, but yes, you're right. Okay. And I'm sorry, I think I missed something. And the length of that is is 30 days after the de declaration of an emergency? Correct. Okay. Except for um, repair and, and cleanup services, which extends for 180 days. Okay. Mm -hmm. So for people who maybe um, obviously wouldn't, Repair doesn't mean replace then in that in that particular setting. Sense. Uh, it, it's uh, repair or reconstruction services used in emergency cleanup. Mm, so okay. um, construction, um, I think it, I think it would apply in that in that situation. But if so that's if someone, if someone's home was burned, I was just trying to think, if someone's home was burned down, then potentially the state law might provide that relief to make sure that there's no gouging for that reconstruction period, even though yeah, that would be optimistic that people were building their homes, but hopefully back in six months, hopefully. I think it's worth pointing out that, um, you know, arguably that provision might uh, apply to people who hire say a landscape maintenance uh, contractor to clean up ash from mm -hmm. the fire that um, has affected most areas of Santa Cruz. But there are, you know, there's not a, um, a building that has been destroyed within city limits or repairs um, or reconstruction within the city that's attributable to the fire. Right, okay. And then the recent um, state, uh, I think it was, I don't know if it was the Senate bill or Assembly bill, uh, 3088, which was passed last August 31st, that was the eviction ban till March 1st, 2021. So evictions, we've got coverage now. So this is really just, um, I think I saw an earlier version, just making sure that evictions, we've got coverage now through state law. Um, so I just wanted to kind of clarify a little bit between the, the intents. Um, and so that's, that's now in place, so we do have um, evictions covered. Um, I guess my thought on this, yeah, is I'm, I'm really in recognition of the management and, and actually deep appreciation for what, um, especially Supervisors Coonerty and McPherson are doing for their constituents right now. And um, um, I just, I think um, really understanding where the county may be going with this um, is I think really fruitful for us to be able to, to uh, have that evaluation. And um, I did speak with um, uh, Supervisor Coonerty's office um, specifically about this. And I do know that they do intend to bring something forward. So. I think um, sort of having them help take the lead might be, um, I, I'm just very interested in that and, and making sure that we craft an ordinance that's, um, uh, you know, uh, sort of following their intentions. And uh, so I'm, I'm uh, sort of leaning towards maybe taking some time and uh, uh, postponing this for just another meeting or so. Thank you. Councilmember Golder. So my question is, is if um, the county does take action at their next meeting, would the city be covered under that kind of umbrella of whatever action they take and would that um, cause us to not have to spend the $1,500 to publish? Because theirs would take precedent? 
I'm not quite sure I understand your question. Would you? Would you? So the question is, if, if if Mayor Cummings passed on his language to the county and the county's considering a similar ordinance at their next meeting, and we kind of just push, push the pause button on ours, and theirs took effect, it would, in essence, like encompass the whole county, including the city, correct? That's what I'm wondering. Is the city also included? So it wouldn't be included in that? No, it wouldn't. Okay. So even if this county enacted something that little the, the city of Santa Cruz would not be included just the county, just yeah, the I, county. Okay. I believe it only apply in the unincorporated areas of the county it's so complicated because all of the building is going to be done in the unincorporated areas of the county and like um, yeah but I'm I guessing most of the residents are probably yeah going to be trying to find a place to stay in the city temporarily but, yeah without without you know without any evidence at the point that price gouging is actually occurring or will occur um i think it's reasonable to assume if it did it would be in relation to uh rentals of hotels and motels possibly residential rentals to the extent that that's not already prohibited by the recent state law um and and uh, sale of goods and services because repairs and reconstruction are not going to take place within the city of Santa Cruz. So, um, so, so this, while this ordinance mirrors the prohibitions of state law, um, it doesn't necessarily presuppose that um, all of these categories w would happen here in Santa Cruz or could happen here in Santa Cruz under the circumstances. I guess that, um, well, move on, Council, Vice Mayor Myers, if you had a, I saw your hand up. Council Member Brown. Sorry, go ahead, Mayor. I would like to, I did raise my hand, but I'll, I'll wait till questions are done. Yeah, and I was looking back, you know, at some of the language on um, rental pricing, because that's one of the things that I think most concerns me is this. You know, the idea that people are going to be looking for housing, and a lot of folks are right now starting to work through their insurance claims and what they're going to get covered by FEMA, and the idea that, you know, people haven't necessarily immediately started looking for rental housing, but they're going to be doing that in the near future as people start to understand how their properties have been impacted in the mountains, and then when as people start making more decisions on, um, you know, where they're going to live next. And um, the conversations I've heard from people um, many people who, once they find out they, they've lost their home, they immediately try to start scrambling to find rentals. And so as we're now getting into this point where, you know, there's on the order of, you know, over a thousand families who might be looking for homes, that's one of the things that most concerns me with, um, you know, what impact it could have on our community in terms of, of rentals. And, and it's going to be, you know, I, I think we're in a sense, somewhat lucky right now that we don't have as many students coming back because, you know, had we been in that situation, but that obviously moving forward is going to be an issue as well. And so I've, I feel like one of the, you know, things that I'm most concerned with is ensuring that people who are evacuated can, you know, securely find housing and that, you know, rates aren't going to go up as a result of, you know, people, as a, as a result of increase in demand. So um, in addition to the you know, hotel issues that we've already seen happen. Um, and just the knowledge that there will be an increase in, in demand for for supplies, especially in a market that's already been impacted by COVID. So. Uh, Council Member, well, Vice Mayor Myers, you had your question, then Council Member Brown, you had your comments. Um. I'll I'll uh, I'll take my hand down. Thank you, okay. Councilmember Brown. Yeah, I, I I don't really have any questions um, at the moment, so I'll I'll just uh, wait to hear public comment. Uh, Councilmember Watkins. 
Um, Tony, can I get a clarifying question? I just want to make sure I heard you accurately. Did you say that a number of the rental housing protections that are encompassed in this are already protected by the recent state law or the governor's order? Is that, or did I mishear you? What the recent state law protects is evictions of people who are financially impacted by COVID-19. So that's, that's specifically what the recent state law addresses. So there may- you, Go ahead, sir. And so what this ordinance or what this law prohibits is evicting someone for purposes of clearing the unit uh, to rent it as someone who has been impacted by um, by the emergency and who may, I mean, the, fear, the, the thought is or the fear is that someone who is being reimbursed by an insurance company may be able to pay higher rents than someone who is not otherwise impacted. And so the, the law prohibits eviction of a tenant for purposes of clearing the unit in order to make room for another um, uh, tenant who's, who's supported by insurance proceeds. Okay, I think I think I got that. <laughs> sorry, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm, it's complicated. Yeah. By the way, is, yeah, some of that would would be covered by the law that was signed, um, the statute that was signed into law last year that that addresses um, uh, no fault evictions. So so that might overlap somewhat uh, as well. Right. Um. The one thing that comes to mind for me too is just, and maybe this is more of a comment, but if, if we're interested in learning what the county's gonna be doing, I think that would be really helpful in not only informing our jurisdiction, but our neighboring jurisdictions like Capitola and beyond. And I say that because um, sort of even just being around town at the dog park or talking to people who may be displaced, they're staying at a friend's house in Capitola or they're out in somewhere else, of, not necessarily in the city, although they're, they're you know hanging out at the city, but. I think if we're going to holistically look at the impacts of those displaced as a region, it might be uh, worthwhile to have have the county take the lead on that for all of our all of our jurisdictions potentially. So just sort of a thought that comes to mind. And one thing I wanted to point out too in the rental, because one of the issues that this is also trying to address is if there are units that are vacant or that become vacant. It's really to protect that increase in the amount that those units can be charged for. So there's one section in here that really focuses on if a unit becomes vacant during the time of proclamation, that it can only be increased by 5% above that previous price it was charged at. And if it wasn't um, on the market, um, that 160% uh, of fair market rent established by Department of Housing and Urban Development, and that could be increased by 5% if the housing is, full, is, is fully furnished. So I guess the point is that you know, a big part of this is also to ensure that if there are vacant units, that those you know, units aren't, we're not gonna see an exorbitant increase in the price of those units that were previously vacant or become vacant during this time as a way of people trying to you know, capitalize off um, what's a big disaster in our area. I guess I would just add that in response to council members' comments, um, is that one of the one of the recommended actions is to coordinate countywide efforts to provide temporary protection from price gouging uh, among all of the jurisdictions in the county. So, um, so that is consistent with um, what what some council members have been commenting on. Uh, so whether you adopt an ordinance today or defer action until you see what the county's done, um, you know there, there is an intention here to do outreach and um, work with the other jurisdictions to to try to um, get us all on the same page with respect to these emergency protections. Uh, Vice Mayor Myers and then Councilmember Brown. I just had one clarifying question, Tony. Um, so with regards to, um, didn't quite get clarification on the question that council member Watkins was asking. Um, so 
So can you, okay, so there's the state law with regards to COVID, um, but there's no, there's no protection through the emergency declaration. I'm just trying to, I'm trying to, trying to understand exactly what our risk level is and I'm trying to accommodate. Um, I, I, I guess I'm kind of getting a little bit lost in the, in the, uh, so the, the the rental piece, if, if someone evicts a tenant to try to raise the price of the unit in order for um, someone who is looking for a home because of losing their home, there's no protections for that right now in the state law? There is some protection from that in the law that was enacted that went into effect on January 1st. Um, that also had some limited uh, restrictions on on price increases. I mean, I think that the, what you're pointing to is is uh, I guess the, or the point that needs to be made is that um, you know this is somewhat of a blunt instrument and it has not been updated in kind of recent uh, actions by the legislature. And I also think that um, you know it's not it's not. Uh, unprecedented to have overlapping state and local restrictions on the same subject matter. And so um, I'm, not, I'm not prepared today to say that, uh, that this ordinance um, doesn't, all, doesn't prohibit uh, actions that are already prohibited under state law. The, I think that Council moves forward. It it would be with the recognition that there's there's some overlap here, and so um, some of it may be already covered. Um, but just in the time during which um, we've had to analyze this, and also in light of the limited um, authorization provided by the penal code under these circumstances, uh, this has merely been intended to um, extend the prohibitions that are already in place under the California Penal Code. Mm -hmm. And so the county could certainly direct that a more refined approach be brought back for further consideration, at which time we sort of screen all the existing uh, state law and local regulations to, to make sure that we're not um, you know, wearing a, a belt and suspenders on all of these different restrictions. So, so that's certainly direction that the council um, could give, but it wasn't really contemplated exercise, which is focused on um, merely providing an, a mechanism for extending prohibitions of state law. Okay. Thank you for that clarification. Thank you, Mayor. Councilmember Brown, and then Tony, I have a question as well. Yeah, so my question is really for my colleagues here. I think I understand the purpose and I understand the um, the reasons that I'm hearing for thinking about doing this differently. Um, but the, I believe the question is, does our city leadership want to declare that price gouging is inappropriate and unacceptable? And to figure out, I don't think we need to take the time to figure out how we can patchwork together other state uh, laws and to make sure that we don't have to do this. I just don't understand why we wouldn't just adopt this as an emergency ordinance today and move forward coordinating with the county uh, uh, moving forward with their, their program. So um, it's just a question. Um, I'll. Uh, wait to hear uh, if there are members of the public who want to speak and then I'm prepared to make a motion. I also want to revisit, I know uh, Council Member Matthews had brought up um, how long this would be in effect. And, you know, I think that what's really kind of encouraged me to bring this forward is just, you know, really wanting to respond to the impacts of the fire and, um, you know, given that we've seen how negatively other communities have been impacted when they've seen similar disasters occur, you know, that's the motivation for bringing this forward. I do think that <clears throat> there is a, a desire, you know, the county's mentioned, I've been in communication when, you know, when we had worked on this item, I'd sent it to um, Supervisor Coonerty so that they could have a copy of this and, you know, work on this as well. Um, 
I think that, um, you know, by moving forward and then being in, in, you know, communication with the county, I think that we have an opportunity to find alignment on when the county will be thinking about um, allowing this to expire. Um, it may be that, you know, if, if maybe that in Watsonville, you know, they don't feel that this is something um, they want to do just given how far away they are from North County. And so, you know, it might, there's, there's a possibility that some of our, um, some of the other cities want to get on board, but possibly not. And it might be that, you know, cities like Scotts Valley would want to have this in place longer just because of the fact that they, you know, are so close to where those damaged areas occur. So um, my hope, is, you know, was really to try to get something out that would um, kind of put some protections in place that could be refined over time as we try to, you know, come into alignment. But just you know, the fact that, um, that, you know, no one's really brought these forward, I thought that it's something that I was hearing, you know, from the community. Um, there are council members who've mentioned, um, you know, some bad ac activities that have occurred as it relates to hotels, and I've also heard that from other supervisors. So, you know, the intention was really to, to try to answer those kind of calls for help from, from people who are being negatively impacted. And in terms of, you know, longevity, I think that there is an opportunity for us to, to really assess that moving forward. Um, so, you know, it doesn't have to be a year or six months. I think that we could really, as time went on and we saw stability within our housing and people moving into, you know, temporary, long-term temporary housing, we can make, you know, assessments on, you know, what would be the appropriate timeline for allowing this to expire. So to answer your question, to get to, get to some of what you were asking, I think that that's kind of my, where I stand on, on how long this would need to be in effect. So if there's no further questions or comments from council, uh, what we can do is open up to the public. Um, so if there are members of the public who are streaming this meeting, if this is an, uh, if this is an item you would like to comment on, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. Um, once you've called in, please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. And when it's your time to speak, you'll hear an announcement that you've been unmuted and the timer will be set to two minutes. And again, this is for item number 26, interim emergency ordinance of the city council of the city of Santa Cruz imposing a prohibition on price gouging in the city of Santa Cruz following the CZU August lightning fire complex. So again, if any members of the public would like to speak to this item, please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand, and you will be given two minutes to speak on this item. not seen any hands from members of the public, I'll bring it back to council for action and deliberation. Council Member Brown. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I just want to make a quick comment uh, that I, I didn't make before during the question period uh, to suggest that, you know, I, I, I think this is something that we can do right now uh, to declare that we believe this is that price gouging is unacceptable. People are in crisis, um, and this is going to be going on for quite some time. We have seen the outpouring of, uh, you know, compassion, generosity, mutual aid, and I believe that is, you know, the best of Santa Cruz, and I believe that is most of Santa Cruz. And um, so I'm not suggesting that this is necessary because there is some predatory behavior looming, but I do believe that we should make that kind of declaration and have some uh, assurance that um, we're not leaving space for bad actors, uh, you know, those who would act in, in, in bad faith while people are in crisis. So with that, I'm going to uh, move 
that. And I also wanted to say, I, you know, I'm not, not going to repeat Mayor Cummings' uh, points about why um, he was bringing this forward. I appreciate it, and I completely agree. Um, so with that, I'll move that we adopt an emergency ordinance and coordinate a countywide effort to provide uh, temporary protection from price gouging in residential rentals, hotels, and other short-term rentals, and goods and services for residents and individuals displaced by the CZU, August Lightning Fire Complex Fire, um, and then to direct the mayor to send a letter to uh, the governor requesting issuance of an executive order suspending the 30-day expiration period specified by Penal Code Section 396 for local price gouging regulation. And, yeah, I'll just leave it there. Okay. Uh, Council Member Byers. Um, well, I'll second the motion first. Uh, but I was just listening to the questions back and forth, and I just sort of landed at why would we not do this? To me, it's just showing our community where our hearts are, where our thoughts are, and whatever we could do. Will it do something? I don't think any of us know for sure, but I just see no downside in simply doing it as a statement and hopefully um, have our communities back if they need it in these issues. Councilmember Matthews. I, I don't support moving ahead, and I think we uh, accept why. There are uh, quite a few uncertainties. There is protection offered by, as I understand it, the state penal code right now for between 30 days and 180 days, depending on this product. And um, uh, I would much prefer to express our interest in dealing with this and uh, come back at, the, um, at our very next meeting to um, uh, give us time to coordinate with the county, other jurisdictions, um, to um, uh, give full consideration to protections included, um, either included or limited by state law, and, uh, and do this in the most efficient mechanism from a procedural point of view um, for the city's operation. So that's how I would prefer to um, approach, and that's why I won't support the motion uh, at hand. Um, I would be prepared to make uh, a substitute motion on the water Council Member Golder, and then uh, Council Member Watkins. I have a question for um, Council Member Brown. And so at the end of your motion, you said something about the 30 days. Can you explain, or the, the letter to the governor, can you say that one more time so I can hear it again? I, I missed that. Sure. Yeah, it, it's in the, it's the, just the wording that was in the packet I, I read okay. about. And okay. So Sorry. The, the goal is to ask for dispensation so we are not um, issuing a 30 day every 30 days and then paying the um, $1,500. Okay. You know, that, so that Tony was describing earlier. So what Tony was describing earlier, we paid the fifteen hundred dollars. That's it. It wouldn't be fifteen hundred a month to renew. Okay. Oh, let me clarify. Yes, yeah, I was. If the city attorney could maybe step in. So the the statute uh, allows the council to extend the prohibitions for successive additional thirty day periods. And in 2018, in connection with the um, just the horrible uh, Sonoma County fires, the governor issued an executive order that suspended that 30-day uh, provision. So that allowed um, local agencies that adopted price gouging to keep them in effect for a longer period of time. So the request would be that the governor do a similar uh, executive order in this instance. Um, okay. And then uh, I know that there may be a substitute motion, but to the extent this motion did not address um, bringing this back as a resolution, I, I was wondering if the maker could consider um, including that as well. Uh, yes, yes. Thank you for the reminder. I wrote it down and then I just read off that from the agenda report. So I just, now I want to make sure I'm clear because 
uh, my understanding was that the, the rationale for uh, requesting the, ex the extension, well, maybe it was twofold, but that, that it, also um, it also allowed us to not have to reissue an emergency every 30 days and be subject to those reporting requirements, public noticing requirements. So is that, is that correct? Well, it's both the fiscal impact of having to publish successively, as well as just the, I guess I'll call it the, the hassle factor of having to take action um, right. within days of the prior action. So in this instance, we would need to bring it back on the 22nd of September because the next meeting in October is more than 30 days from today. Um, gotcha. And then if you take action on September 22nd, we would have to bring it back on October 13th because the next council meeting after the 22nd is more than 30 days from um, the 22nd. So, uh, so that's right. Those are the two reasons for um, that. Thanks. So I think I think this is the other thing I was kind of wanting to say is to take to speak to Cap. Um, council member buyers is like why we wouldn't do this and as I think everybody on the council and probably in the meeting wholeheartedly agrees that price gouging is horrible um, the only thing I would think is that if it was going to occur I would guess it would happen either um, probably with the rebuilding process and maybe I'm being naive, but I remember the day the power went back on after the earthquake, my dad's answering machine had 99 messages on it and that was as high as it would go because he was a masonry contractor, everyone's chimney fell down. And so the thing that I learned after that was then all of a sudden these out of town masons came to town and those had sirens on top and they were doing the price gouging. And so if there was a way for us to work with the county on like, or maybe with Bonnie on like, distributing a list of reputable contractors within the city or county or working with people on those kind of strategies because the way I foresee like people getting ripped off would be in that reconstruction process in some way and more with the services rather than maybe the goods and I think like right now the dust has kind of settled as far as like the hotels like people are either in a hotel or a temporary shelter and I think they're probably moving towards like like um, the mayor said like what's the next thing like long term months two years where however long the rebuilding process is going to take and I think um, as as much as we could align with what's happening in the city and state I think would be um, and offer the same kind of protection I, that, that that's where you know my mind is going is that um, yes I 100% want something um, on the books but I think it is more applying to the county than the city right now. And I don't know if that's my thought. I just have a quick question uh, for the city attorney. And um, I don't see the fire chief on, but I'm just, or yeah, I see the fire chief on as well. And maybe he can speak to this as well. But I'm just wondering when the emergency was declared for this particular fire complex, because I would imagine that. Um, that was probably declared at least, you know, the fire was yeah, I, I can 16th. So yeah. 30 days from that is going to go beyond, beyond, you know. Uh, that the city manager um, declared uh, a local emergency on the 21st of mm -hmm. August. So it would be measured from that date um, at the, and then the council uh, also took action on the 25th of August by adopting a resolution declaring an exist, the existence of a state of emergency. And the, and the statute um, uh, does extend from three days from the date of a declaration of emergency by the, by the governor or by uh, a local agency. So, um, so. Uh, arguably, the most recent declaration was the 25th of, of August. Okay, I just wanted to double check on that. Um, Council Member Watkins. Um, I, I think there's, 
if I'm hearing everybody correctly, I think there's really a lot of agreement around what we're wanting to see here, which is not to have price gouging acceptable in our community. Um, what we can do as a local jurisdiction to pre prevent that and to um, put in policies to protect people. Um, I do just sort of speaking to some folks up there who are looking at how they're managing their properties. I do think, in terms of the comments that, that Councilmember Golder made in regards to those that are doing services in, in the fire, the cleanup of the ash, and those who are going to be contracted to clean up the ash, it's so so he heavy and thick up there that they were saying it's it's going to be hard to find people to do that. So I do think there is definitely going to be areas where we're going to need to have really strong policy in place for price gouging. Um, I do also feel like I'm hearing uh, a couple things that one, that this could potentially not be the most um, cost effective uh, approach. And, and Tony, if I'm mishearing you or what Bonnie's concerns was, you're, you know, I welcome your input on that. Um, and that too, that there's still interest in wanting to learn more about uh, what the county is, is doing in terms of their item coming on the 15th, or is that, did I hear you saying at the next meeting that the county is having? So I, I don't know, I guess I'm wondering if, if this isn't an emergency item that has passed, then how can we, to Councilor Brown's uh, point, acknowledge that, one, I think we've all seen a really outpouring of, of generosity and contribution of, from our community, and two, that we won't, uh, it, we won't enable those who are trying to take advantage of the situation. And if it's not in the form of, of an emergency ordinance at this moment, I, I don't know how else that could be expressed. I don't know if you have thoughts on that, Tony. Well, the the, uh, the penal code uh, merely states that the uh, prohibitions can be extended by action of the local legislative body. It doesn't clearly specify that it has to be by ordinance. And that's why um, I suggested that, and, and it, what I would explore between now and the next meeting is bringing this forward in the form of a resolution. In preparing for this item um, under time constraints, um, the most logical uh, avenue forward appeared to me to be an emergency ordinance. And that's what I've seen examples of other cities doing as well. Um, but with a little more time to reflect on it, it makes, and, and given the comments that were made by the city clerk only after the the item was published, or at, I guess last Thursday on the date that the report was going to be published, um, the sort of the fiscal impact uh, consideration didn't really play into my analysis in preparing the item. So, so you are suggesting, if I'm hearing what you're saying accurately, you're suggesting that uh, you would like additional time if, if this does not pass to then bring this back after consulting with the county in the form of a resolution. Is that sound correct? I would continue to explore that as a possibility, um, merely for the for the ease of uh, taking action and the and the procedural, um, you know, eliminating the procedural burdensomeness of it, and also the fact that. Um, you know, you need five votes to get this thing adopted today. So, um, so that could um, also affect the voting that would be needed in order to take action. Okay. Yeah. Okay. No, I appreciate that, and I think you know, if if the county hasn't done it as an emergency and it's in the unincorporated areas, and then um, and you were and you felt rushed as not to be able to uh, further explore that, that maybe that could be a path forward. Okay. Thank you. Councilmember Matthews, and then Vice Mayor Myers and Councilmember Brown. I think we're all awfully close here. I'm just wondering if the maker of the motion would consider revising it um, to state that the city council is committed to addressing the issue of price gouging recognizing that there are current protections offered by state law and we can adopt a local resolution prior to the uh, expiration of those protections um, that we continue this to the next meeting, et cetera. So uh, again, for the purpose of coordinating as much as possible with the county's efforts um, and that we adopt this, we do this in the most efficient mechanism from the city's procedural point of view. Um, 
I think we're just all there. <laughs> that, that, um, Councilmember Matthews, thank you for uh, raising that. I think that's a, a different motion, however, so I'd like to just go ahead and vote on this one. I, I think I know where it's going, but I don't understand why we want to try to make it overly complicate this. Um, as a, I'm, I'm just not sure what the goal is in um, trying to put it off. And be, given that there's not really a downside to doing it now, um, aside from, I, I don't even see the downside of going, doing this ahead of the county if we're going to be coordinating with them. Mayor Cummings has already been in contact with them. Um, so it just, it doesn't, I'm just not clear why we would uh, just avoid this right now. So I'll just go ahead and, and leave the motion as is. And um, with the addition of uh, bringing this back by resolution uh, that uh, the city attorney mentioned, and uh, then we'll, well, you can go ahead and make that motion. Then I would like to, with the mayor's recognition. Sorry, I couldn't hear Cynthia. Cynthia, can you? I couldn't hear what you just yeah, said. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to then uh, offer a substitute, I mean, a substitute motion. Um, uh, the city council is committed to taking action on the issue of price gouging following the uh, uh, local wildfires, recognizing there are currently protections in place for price gouging under state law and that we can take action at our next meeting within the, uh, prior to the expiration of those protections, um, that we continue this to the next meeting uh, with instructions to coordinate as much as possible with the county's anti-gouging uh, regulations and efforts, um, and that we uh, bring this back in the most efficient form from the city's procedural point of view. I'll second that. Okay. Councilmember Matthews, is there any way we can get that like on screen? Oh, <laughs> I have it. I got it. I'll, I'll share my screen. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks, Bonnie. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was just going to type it out and email it. Sure. But. So that motion was made by Councilmember Matthews seconded by Vice Mayor Myers. Um, I know there were some hands up, so I'll see if I can get to these. Yeah, Vice Mayor Myers, you were up next. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm gonna, yeah, I'm, I'm seconded the, the substitute motion. And actually the mayor and I talked about this quite a bit last week. Um, absolutely no intent that we don't acknowledge as an entirety of a community um, the tragedy that people are experiencing up in the valley, Bonnie Dune, um, out on the North Coast. Um, and, um, you know, I've heard reference to Santa Rosa and Paradise. Those both were, you know, town, town council and cities that actually were, there was, you know, tremendous damage done within, within the, the governing limits of those jurisdictions. Um, so I, I really think that we would all benefit, and I actually think a regional approach is really critical. Um, and I, I really, I just support the concept of actually working cooperatively with our, our co-government uh, leaders over at the county. Um, this, again, the fires are in the county jurisdiction, um, and I trust very much that Supervisor Coonerty, Supervisor McPherson are absolutely laser focused, as are all the supervisors, on helping, helping the constituents up in those locations. So um, this is not, um, you know, from my perspective, this is not um, trying to off-put or offset or delay any kind of protections for people who need to either find resources or move into permanent or temporary housing um, here in the city. Um, I feel like we, um, we really would benefit as an entirety of a county to really just take the time. Um, the county will be looking at this in seven days, and I think it's just, it's, um, it's really important for us to work with them regionally on this. Um, 
And again, uh, I think I think it's a good path to go, and uh, I I I also support the idea of having a resolution passed as well. So thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Councilmember Brown. Yeah, I um, I just want to add in, in response to some of the uh, concerns expressed or the the statements about this being an issue affecting uh, folks in the county and not within the city limits. Um, those are the very same people who are right now sheltered, some of them within the city limits, who are looking at finding uh, potentially short-term rentals um, or longer term, depending on how long the rebuilding process takes. And much of that is going to happen within the city. So, uh, and and the, the goods and, you know, and the contracting services and all of those things are often uh, based within the city. So I do believe that we have a responsibility to, uh, you know, in, in recognizing that, to address it right here within our own jurisdiction. And I, I also, I, I just um, fundamentally disagree that doing this now is somehow um, negating a desire to coordinate with the county. I, that's just not the case. Um, so I'll, I'll leave it there and uh, wait to vote on We'll be voting on uh, accepting the substitute before voting on the substitute motion. Is that correct? Okay. Thanks. Yeah. yeah. Mayor. <laughs> yep. Yeah. No, I was I was about to say something. So um, we have a substitute motion. It's currently on the floor, and I'll just state that um, I, you know, I don't want to, you know, downplay any of my colleagues and any of our desire to try to help our residents. I think this is a, you know, there's two different approaches that we're, we're taking at this. And, um, you know, one of the things that was recommended before I brought this forward was that I went to the, um, you know, I discussed this with the county first. And so um, that's one of the, you know, reasons why I was so encouraged to bring this forward. And also with following up um, with county supervisors and um, Council, County Supervisor Cooner in particular, you know, asking again whether they were going to bring something forward to which they should. He, he said that they would be. So I just want to, you know, put it out there that this, you know, wasn't part of what really um, encouraged me to bring this forward was those conversations with the county. Um, and I, I guess I have one more question for the city attorney, um, which is. If we, I just want to get some clarification around the re, the resolution because it seems to me that you know, regardless of what we do, we're going to have to make declare some kind of emergency, and then the timeline associated with that emergency, you know, potentially if the language is in the emergency that we can bring back resolution to extend that timeline. That's what we're. That's what that resolution would allow for. Is that correct? What I had in mind was adding language to the draft ordinance that's in front of you that would uh, allow the prohibitions of the ordinance to be extended by subsequent city council action by resolution. Um, if, if I could share my screen, Bonnie. Oh. Something along these lines. So that's, that makes that's, sense. Kind of, that's kind of what I had in mind. Yeah. That makes sense, and it seems like it's similar to what we did with um, the eviction protections, the COVID-19 evictions protections, kind of aligning them with, with state law. Right, and we'll be bringing that back uh, to the council at the second meeting in September and the COVID-19 emergency declaration an additional 60 days. Okay. Um, so I guess um, all that's to say that, you know, 
there's a lot of thought that went into this, and you know, I think that we all want the same things. And, and you know, if we end up on a different path to getting there, that's fine. I think that we're going to be, you know, we're we're trying, we're all trying to do what's best for the community. Um, but I, you know, I think that right now we have two different approaches, and you know, regardless of the outcome, my hope is that we can just get the protections that our residents need, and that we're kind of ahead of any type of um, negative impacts that could impacts that could negatively affect our residents and people in our community. Um, Council Member Matthews. Um, I agree with you on that. Um, I do have a question and maybe a suggestion. To the extent that we're hearing about um, possible gouging right now, I think it would be, um, and to the effect that where it's most likely happening is in the unincorporated area, um, it might be useful to ask the county, the supervisors, to uh, let people know how to how to uh, file a complaint on that because they've been very good about notifying residents and businesses about if you have a claim about this, here's who you contact, et cetera. So I think that's a, a request we could get to them right away if people do um, feel that there's been gouging. Uh, who do they turn to in terms of the state? Um, uh, complaint. That's just a suggestion. Um, and then I did have a question for Tony. Um, does the gouging occur where the service is delivered or where the business is located? That is, um, let's just say there's a building supply place in the city of Santa Cruz, but the job is up in the county. Where? Yeah. You know what, what the nature of the gouging is, and so clearly um, in rental housing that would be rental housing located within the city of Santa Cruz. Yeah, I, I get that. I'm thinking more the building supply. Uh, or building supplies, I argue, um, is the location where the sale is made, as opposed to where the goods are delivered. So that would but, be the business. Hey, the um, Penal Code Section 396 um, does not have uh, a long list of uh, reported appellate decisions in the annotations that flesh out the nuances of that. And so, yeah. uh, you know, that would be a prosecutor's... Um, okay, great. I don't think we have a second yet. Oh, it was, the motion was made by Council Member Matthews, seconded by Vice Mayor Myers. Got it. Yeah, I guess, I guess my only last comments would be, I think we, um, I think what I'm hearing from everybody is the same, which is essentially how can we as a community come together to support this really tragic event and um, uh, whether it be to do something immediately or to have a little bit more information and coordination that this isn't really a, you know, a need to be uh, politicized, but this is a need for us to come together to support our, our residents. So I appreciate the sentiments that were shared by every council member and including you, the mayor, in terms of how how we want to really do right by, by our community and um, the paths are different, but they're essentially with the same intention. So I'll leave it at that. Okay. Okay. Um, Council Member Byers. You're muted, by the way. Council Member Watkins finished her statement. Because I've been trying to figure out there are two baths. We're on the path. We're committed to doing it. And I can't quite figure out exactly what the difference is. If we're all going to do it in two weeks, or why not do it here? Somebody tell me what, what is the difference? Can anyone answer that? <laughs> or it is political, or it isn't political. No, no. Well, that's why I'm just trying to, I'm, I'm asking the question because nobody answered. One is would be immediately today, it'd be effective the 8th um, from Tony's words there, or we delay it for two weeks, and it may or may not be um, what the county's doing, or maybe the county for, for are struggling, like we're all struggling, and don't do it next week or whatever. We, I don't know. I, I just, um, 
I, I'm trying to sort that out. I, I uh, we're on a path, but anyway, if anyone's got any words, that's struggling with that. I'm not so much struggling with it. I'm just trying to understand it. Councilmember Matthews and Councilmember Watkins. Oh, I, you know, not to drag this out too much, but I think we often find that we can be more effective when there's, uh, uh, when we increase the degree of consistency of uh, yeah. regulations, whether they be plastic pollution or whatever, uh, among the jurisdictions, and particularly this is one that the fires are in the in the mountains, but the, I think the repercussions are are being felt. Uh, right. on a much more regional basis, that's, that's obvious. So to the extent we can come up with a more consistent package of protections, I think that benefits everybody. It benefits the consumers, it benefits the service providers. Um, uh, we are not um, removing any of the protections currently in place by state law. We can take action right. and hopefully be more consistent with the what the rest of the county is doing and um, do it in a way that's uh, efficient from the point of view of city procedures and have it in place, uh, have it on the agenda and do it at our next meeting and express our commitment to get this done. Council Member Byers. So just one more question. Um, in a sense then we would be, t we would be the first out of the shoot with uh, it, with this action, and maybe the county will look at ours and adopt what we're doing. But my guess, my question is, Tony, if if we do it, and then we see that the county has stuck something in theirs that's a little bit, I don't know, stronger or whatever, how do we amend our original? Well, um, it's going to come to have to come back to the council anyway. So, you know, oh, okay. if. In now in the 22nd, the, there is a coordination of efforts among the um, the cities and the county. Then um, I would imagine we would be bringing back something um, that's more uniform with what the other jurisdictions are doing. And it and it they might just look at this and say that's a great model. Let's go with it. Um, or we might decide that some more nuanced approach is is preferable. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Tony. Okay, with that, um, if there's no further questions right now, um, there's a substitute motion that is on the floor, and I'll turn it over to the city clerk to call the vote on the substitute motion that was made by <laughs> Councilman Oh no! To, the, to to for the consideration okay. of the substitute motion. Mm -hmm. Yes, this is to accept the, the substitute motion. Correct. Councilmember Byers. No. Matthews. Aye. Brown. No. Golder. Aye. Watkins. Aye. Vice Mayor Myers. Aye. And Mayor Cummings. No. That passes with Council Members Golder, Watkins, Matthews, Vice Mayor Myers voting in favor to accept the substitute motion. Council Members Brown, Byers, and Mayor Cummings voting opposed. And so now at this point in time, we have the um, substitute motion before us. Bonnie, could you put that language back on the screen, mm -hmm. please? protections in place under state law, the city can take action at the next meeting prior to expiration of state protections.
Prior to what? Expiration of state protection. And Tony, correct me if I'm understanding that wrong, but that's how I understand it. Um, so we can, uh, therefore, <laughs> we continue it to the next meeting. Continue the item to the next meeting. Instructions to coordinate with the county to add anti-gouging efforts. And bring that, bring the items back. So can I make a couple of minor um, suggestions? Uh, yeah, sure. I'm just trying to make complete sentences out of this. Uh, bear with me for a second while I read it through one more time. So, um, so my recommendation would be that you change the word recognizing to recognizes. Oh, yeah. Is committed, recognizes there are current protection state law. And, and, and then after state law comma that you insert the word and that. Yeah. And that the city can take action in the next phase for state protection. Yeah. After Therefore, the beginning of the next clause, uh, therefore continues the item. So add an S after continue. Yeah. So, with instructions to coordinate with the county's anti gouging efforts and bring the item back at our next meeting. At the next meeting, in the most efficient form from the city's procedural point of view. I'd like to ask the maker and the seconder of a motion if there can be um, a couple things added to this as a friendly amendment. Um, one, um, that we, number two from the recommendation, which was direct the mayor to send a letter to California yeah. governor. Yeah, um, that's good. So the language that's included in the staff report. Um, yeah. Yeah, that. That's fine. Um, that we also send the language in um, today's agenda report to the county uh, for consideration or reference. I don't know what the best, or yeah, to the county for, for reference. Yeah, and I think that's that, fine. That was, that was actually thoroughly implied in my my comment about coordinating with the county, but it's, it's and fine. I, I will just offer to the council that, um, that, that I will also share it with um, the city attorneys for Scotts Valley and Capitol. Mm -hmm. And Watsonville, yeah, with other jurisdictions in the county, yeah. Yep. Yep. And I would add also that we ask the um, county to um, provide guidance for residents who um, most immediately want to seek relief under the state protection. Is it the, just to let them know how to file complaints? Well, I would say um, take action. Uh, Can you restate that? That, um, that we ask the county to provide guidance for local residents who want to who, who want to pursue uh, action regarding potential price gouging. And under state law.
That's not an apostasy in the attorney. Thing. I'll do grammar corrections before we move on. Not And uh, I'm also wondering if there's Within that city attorney's issue with other cities attorney, city attorneys in the county, whether there, you know, a letter should go to the other city councils from the mayor, um, letting them know that we're putting these into effect and to consider similar. You know, I, I why don't we just put direct um, the city attorney and mayor to communicate our interest and agenda report with other local jurisdictions. You just, you, you can both do it. <laughs> or even like intentions and agenda reports. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Again, I think, you know, we're all headed in the same direction here. Mm. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, I'm hoping this will get us in the right direction, and so um, we'll be looking forward to see what comes out of the county, and um, hopefully we can do what's best to support our community. And although we didn't, you know, we weren't able to have something concrete today, I think we're all going in the right direction. Councilmember Golder. When moving forward to uh, Mayor, if you wouldn't mind sharing that, um, if, if there's some way we could be proactive in educating residents about about ways um, to get reputable contractors too. Because I feel like that's, that's another, that's if gouging was gonna happen, a huge long-term problem. Yeah. Um, I feel like it's, <laughs> that's a bit of a heavy lift. <laughs> I know, even if it's just a list, even if it's just a list or something from the county of people that have, I mean, I, I, I don't, I don't, I don't really know. Just mentioning that they could, I don't know. Yeah, you're right. It is hard, but, but, um, I don't know. I, I so, think uh, some, that regard can be done at a, at a staff level, but yeah. not really oh. the topic, this agenda item. So, um, no, I just meant even not even within the city. I meant for the county, like in his conversations with the county. Yeah, was something they could do, and not that I'm directing staff or 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 the mayor to do it. Just mentioning during conversations. You know, I think something else we can consider is um, kind of strengthening that language around and having resources on our website for people who may feel like they are um, experiencing some form of exploitation so that people know who to contact and then, yeah, just to whatever degree we can figure out some kind of like Yelp or, you know, recommendation system for contractors, et cetera, then, yeah, we can think about how that might be able to happen. Be careful what you wish for. I don't want the city to be running an alternative to Yelp. Uh, yeah, yeah. No, 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 no. Okay. Maybe just like, yeah. Anyways, and I, I don't know if people have business licenses within the county, but just even just a list of people who have business licenses in the city. That's all, that's all I kind of was thinking, or business license in the county. So that, I, I don't know. I don't know what I'm thinking. I just, I just don't want people to be taking advantage of and that's where my mind you know, goes. If, if, if I could make a final comment. Generally, and I think it's in all the advice that goes out around any of this stuff, it says, seek a licensed contractor, et cetera. I mean, there's some general, you know, if you're going to put solar on your home, there's some general advice, and that's one of them. And even within that range, there's the good and the bad. Okay. Well, with that, um, let's go ahead. If there's no further questions or comments, let's go ahead and take the roll call vote on this item. And then um, following this item, we will uh, open up to oral communications. Councilmember Byers? Aye. 
Matthews? Aye. Brown? Aye. Golder? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Vice Mayor Myers? Aye. And Mayor Cummings? Aye. That passes unanimously. So um, with that, we'll move on to our last item of this evening, which is oral communications. Oral communications is an opportunity for members of the public to address us on items that are not on our agenda. Uh, if you are streaming the meeting and you'd like to call in to comment during oral communications, now is the time. Uh, please call one of the numbers that you see on your screen. Once you dial in, please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand and you will have two minutes to speak. When it's your time to speak, you'll hear an announcement that you've been unmuted and we request that you clearly state your name before making your comments so that we can accurately capture it in the meeting minutes. However, that is not required. So first caller. Yeah, hi, this is Garrett uh, Phillip again. Hey, I, I see my most excellent idea of proclaiming September White Man Appreciation Month was a no-show. I'm pretty sure that breakthrough idea is never going to happen, I suspect because of widespread prejudicial opinion. No rational being would think every German is a Nazi or every Muslim is a jihadist convert or die crusader who thinks enforcing Sharia law has a place in the United States. Some individuals of those groups possibly are or think such, but the existence of some does not define all individuals in a group. Such is one of the many flaws embedded into the resentment hate-based group identity politics of the left, such as critical race theory, intersectionalism, and white privilege myth. In the activist progressive leftist movement, supported by dozens of make-a-buck books, media, and leftist educators, white men are generally portrayed as universally racist and evil. This is a vile falsehood. Proclaiming White Man Appreciation Month would go a little ways toward erasingly burying that false narrative and is really no different than the reasons to proclaim an appreciation month for any group. Also, what a great office water cooler eyebrow razor. If the Awazwas, who really don't have a recognized valid land treaty claim, can get an unceded land declaration reminder ad nauseum almost every meeting for unfortunate events occurring hundreds of years ago, one would think in real time white men could get appreciation once anyway because white men do have deeds and play, pay plenty for, you'd think, appreciated government salaries. Stranger things have happened. On a different matter, I see the slow streets has been implemented so far according to my anticipated fears. It consists of street closed to through traffic signs, which technically means the street is closed to general public travel after, as I recall, staff promised that wouldn't happen. Yep, we have special interest people who wanted their public street converted into their private street for their sole personal private satisfaction using COVID hysteria justifications. With a vast experience daily dog walking some of these streets, there are no traffic or other justifications for these conversions. Uh, you've been had. Bye. Thank you. Okay, next speaker. Hello, I'm Sebastian Stock, a resident. Um, the city is coming off yet another record-breaking heat wave. The heat presents hardships to all of us, but especially to the city's homeless. And the biggest cause of homelessness is the shortage of homes. The council recognizes this. Each of you campaigned on building more affordable housing, but the city looks essentially the same as it was at the time of the last election. I don't suggest the council has ignored the issue. I commend the decision to expand the building height limit to seven stories and to convert the Garfield Circles Church into a single-family housing complex, even though multifamily housing would definitionally be able to house more people. But that's the point. It's something. This is a crisis. Crises require alacrity, not fussing about whether more people might be housed in an imaginary proposal. Unfortunately, the City Planning Commission has done exactly that, voting on an amendment that will further delay the construction of a seven-story apartment complex on the San Lorenzo Riverfront that would have 175 housing units, including 20 low-income units, out of the hope that they could wrangle, and I quote, 26 low-income units instead. 
The project has been waiting approval for over a year, during which period, of course, no one has been housed in the area. This is no isolated incident, but is illustrative of a decades-long failed housing policy that has led to a housing shortage so severe that the purchasing power for housing in Santa Cruz is less than 80 percent of the national average. Search Santa Cruz housing ranking on the web, and you'll find the phrases crushingly unaffordable, least affordable city in California, and the nation's least affordable city for teachers. Whose fault do we think this is? Santa Cruz has been a liberal stronghold for decades. We can't blame Donald Trump. It is our fault. If there are any members of the public who'd like to speak to us on oral communications, now is the time to call in um, using the numbers on your screen. Once you've called into the meeting, please press star nine on your phone and to raise your hand. And once you've been unmuted, you'll, give, you'll be given two minutes to speak. It looks like the caller's called back in. If you could please press star nine on your phone, uh, you'll be given two minutes to speak. Last four digits are 0443. Please press star six on mute. Hello? Hello, council members. Uh, my name is Susan Cavalieri. I'm requesting that the garage complex on lot four not be built. We need this space for the majestic heritage trees to cool the city center as the temperatures, as the temperatures soar. These trees not only provide shade, but purify the air, absorb carbon dioxide, and release oxygen. We know the state is burning. Excessive heat has dried vegetation, and fires have burned over 2 million acres because of climate heating. Many children are experiencing the climate crisis now and have lost their homes to these fires. Many more children have needed to quickly gather their prized possessions and evacuate with their families as smoke and ash fall, uh, fill the air. Many of our youth fear for their future. If our children are to have a future, emissions must be reduced to near zero over the next 10 years. Transportation is the biggest producer of emissions in our county. Therefore, transportation needs to shift away from gas-burning cars and SUVs to electric vehicles, bikes, walking, and fare-free transit. With fewer cars, there is no need to build a garage on Lot 4. To, de to decrease emissions, we do need to save the heritage trees and not build the garage. The city needs to ban the re removal of heritage trees and I believe the city needs to prioritize policies that reduce emissions for the sake of our children. 
please do not build the garage complex on lot four. Save the trees and renovate the existing library. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, seeing no new callers um, on, the, on oral communications, um, I'd just like to bring it back to council. Thank you all for joining us today uh, and for this meeting, and thank you to the staff, and um, hope that everyone continues to stay safe out there. That concludes our meeting. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.